Okay, we're recording. All right, so this is the um, January 19th meeting of the North Region um, Policing Review uh, Commission. Uh, we are meeting remotely. The meeting is being recorded as well. Um, so we'll start with a call to order. It looks like we were just joined by a couple more folks. Noah, can you give us a roll call? Yes. Lois. Here. Elizabeth. Not yet. Um, Booker. Also not yet. Dan. Yep. Nick. Here. David. Here. Alex. Here. Javier. Here. Namdi. Here. Michael. Here. Josie. Here. Cynthia. Here. And Carol. Here. And welcome, Chris. And Chris. Hello. Welcome, welcome Chris. Chris. Welcome. Great. Okay. Thank you all. Awesome. So um, with that, um, we'll go over um, the meeting minutes. Did anyone have any changes um, or amendments to the meeting? Uh, minutes uh, from sorry from two weeks ago <laughs> all right then i'll move to approve those minutes and noah can you count us through yes lois yes elizabeth oh, not here yet um booker's not here yet Dan. Yes. Nick. Yes. David. Yes. Alex. Yes. Javier. Yes. Namdi. Yes. Michael. Yes. Josie. Yes. Cynthia. Yes. Carol. Yes. And Chris, though you were not here, I will say your name. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. All right, um, so we'll move on to agenda item number two, which is the public comment period, where we'll open this up for 30 minutes to public comment. Um, public comments are limited to three minutes. Um, so I'm gonna set a timer. Um, at the end of that, I will ask you to finish your last sentence. Um, to uh, make a, couple, a public comment, um, you just need to raise your hand in Zoom and that will let me know that um, in what order you wanna make a comment. To do that, you go to the participants menu um, and select raise hand or to the reactions menu or reactions item down on the bottom and select raise hand there, um, depending on the version of Zoom that you're using. If you can't figure that out, you can use the chat to send me a message and I'll keep track of um, who's going in and in what order so I can still call on you if you're having trouble there. All right, so we're going to begin. I just need to get my timer set up. <laughs> yeah, there we go. All right, um, so we're going to start and the first person with their hand raised is Robert Easton. All right, hi everyone. Um, I just wanted to Thank you for your continued hard work and to congratulate you on uh, putting out your preliminary report last week. Um, despite the fact that the Gazette gave Chief Casper the platform to tear it apart, I think you had a pretty good defense of it. Um, and uh, one note in particular about uh, concern of uh, police working overtime and being too tired. I actually did uncover a quote that justifies that concern from Chief Casper that I'll forward you all by email later. Um, additionally, I just wanted to again ask you as the commission to work with the council to ask the mayor to immediately reallocate the cut funds from the police budget. Um, you know, I feel like the people really called for that and this is their money and the mayor is holding it hostage. Um, and I also just wanted to uh, point out that a commission member in a city council budgetary meeting over the summer um, in response to a lot of the testimony, even at that point, recognized that the next step should be reallocating those funds to our paramedic corps. 
So I don't know. I feel like there are no rules about if and when you guys put forth recommendations. And Jim Nash had asked, are you asking anything of us tonight? And I feel like maybe that was a missed opportunity to do that. And I'm not sure how much time I have left, but if I have another minute, I'll share a conversation I had with my friend today. She is a 30 year old white woman who lives in Northampton in a mixed income building. Uh, there are several residents who are section eight. It's a pretty uh, policed building. She's autistic and is under a lot of stress right now as we all are, but you know, some extenuating circumstances and is fearful of a uh, potential autistic meltdown uh, in the near future and is terrified of experiencing a meltdown in the presence of police. And she shared with me a common technique uh, the autistic community uses, which is to carry a card in their wallet that explains uh, what the situation is to hand to police. But of course, that requires reaching into your pocket uh, and is not a safe way for black or brown people, autistic people. Uh, to do it. So I just wanted to share some of her fears and worries uh, about being autistic and policing in the community. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, the next person is Al Simon. Uh, good evening, I'm a resident in Ward 2, and I'd first like to start by thanking you all for serving in this volunteer capacity. Uh, having to do this type of work at a time where you can't meet in the same place certainly makes it very harder for you, and I appreciate your effort. Uh, I've read the preliminary report. I'd like to offer some comments. Um, first, fundamentally, concerns about police behavior arise because of a lack of independent accountability. That is decisions regarding complaints or disciplinary actions are made internally with results that suggest a biased process. There is currently no recommendation from uh, this commission for the development of independent oversight with full disciplinary authority. In my view, this is essential and an immediate need. And I urge you to include this issue in the remaining time that you have, even if it requires excluding other items. Some of the discussions regarding budget and expense seem premature. I suggest the commission focus on determining what the appropriate staffing level ought to be for Northampton before making recommendations about spending. Uh, reductions in call for service do not necessarily lead to reductions in staffing. For example, if the schools faced a 10% reduction in enrollment, uh, staff reductions may or may not take place depending on, on how that uh, distribution in reduction um, uh, is distributed. And thinking of the fire department, if we cut the number of fires in half, for example, does this mean we need half the firefighters? Well, obviously the answer is no. Public safety needs to be staffed for what can reasonably de uh, be determined could happen. It does not appear the commission has reviewed the relevant collective bargaining agreements to understand their role and the cost of operation of the police department. This information in conjunction with knowing the department's policy on uh, minimum staffing will bring understanding of what obligations currently exist and is relevant to the need to determine uh, what the desired staffing levels should be. Uh, finally, I suggest it is a mistake to see the current police budget to be the sole or even the primary source of income for social service support that must be increased. Uh, the police department didn't create the situation we have where they respond to calls driven by homelessness or drug addiction or other social ills. It's a collective failure of our community, state and nation to address the social problems that have led to a call the cops answer to all problems. We should be prepared to fund what is needed. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you. Uh, the next person is uh, Buju Dasgupta. Thanks, Dan. Um, I too wanna to start by thanking you all for your service. This is probably is taking enormous amounts of time and I'm really grateful uh, that all of you are, are doing this work on behalf of all of us. Um, so I'm part of a group of concerned Northampton residents and we are all deeply invested in advancing social justice locally through our actions. And following the work of this commission has been sort of one way we want to have some impact. Um, so I was struck by the statement in that preliminary report that although the black population in Northampton is only 2.2%, 2 
the number of, of arrests of black folks in our community is 14 to 16% in the past five years. And that's really disturbing. Um, and, and this big race gap wasn't obvious to me when I looked at the incident report on the police database for several years. Um, and this is because I can tell you as a, as a social scientist who deals with numbers, that this is because the NPD report reports incidents one at a time and doesn't provide aggregate data separated by race or sex or gender identity or any other group. And sometimes in order to see patterns in the data, you need to zoom out and look look um, uh, sort of at aggregates. So one thing that I really urge this commission uh, to do is to ask the NPD and the city to make public annual reports showing summary statistics on the race, sex, gender identity, and any other uh, demographics of persons who are targets of police action, what actions were taken, the final disposition of these incidents, something that is visually easy, easily, easily digestible. Um, and I think these annual reports should be followed by by some sort of public discussion um, of what the data look like, where the biases exist, and only then can we figure out uh, um, sort of what the remedies are for, for direct action by police. Um, I feel really that, that in order to get a handle on what the problems are and how we can address it, we need really good data and tracking systems that are easily understandable and publicly available and followed by some conversation between our public officials and, and the rest of us in the community. So thank you again, and I look forward to seeing your final report in a couple of months. All right, thank you. Uh, the next person, oop, um, the next person was Ya Peng, um, but their hand is down now, so we'll move on. This is to Nip, uh, sorry, Nick Papochis. Sorry if I'm butchering that name. No, that's okay. That name is frequently mispronounced. No, not a problem. Thank you to the commission for all your time and the opportunity to make a few remarks about um, the reaction of a group of citizens who, who live up in Village Hill who are concerned about racial and social injustice. Uh, we've looked at the preliminary report of the Northampton Policing Review Commission and especially the section on policies and spending subcommittee. It's an impressive document outlining all kinds of social remedies for social ills and mental health services. We would like to, however, make the following recommendations about the way in which mental health services can be addressed by the Northampton Police Department. We want to make these recommendations in an effort to support the work of the police who are dealing with these issues within the Northampton community. And we think that this will improve the Northampton Police Department's ability to offer the community better services and reduce the burden that officers have in 9-11 calls. So let me make the following five recommendations. Be one, be sure that there are police officials who have training and sensitivity to the mental health issues outlined in the preliminary report to coordinate and communicate with the various mental health services available within the Northampton area. And if someone within Northampton Police Department doesn't have that skill set, consider hiring somebody among your new hires, someone who has a degree in both forensic work and mental health. You may even want to add to that hiring a mental health professional to augment police interventions. Two, develop ways to improve and build mental health sensitivity in the police department to improve the interventions that get made. Three, improve the dispatch system so the dispatchers can determine whether the police calls require mental health interventions rather than armed police interventions and offer ongoing consultation to the dispatchers to improve their diagnostic skill set. And this can mean different training for dispatchers when they start. Four, to reduce the cost of training new police personnel, consider rehiring. 
some of the police officers who were let, let, laid off earlier because of the budget cuts, especially if they're members of diverse groups. They've already been trained and are familiar with the Northampton area. And finally, offer ongoing training in mental health to Northampton police officers in order to increase their sensitivity. We just hope that somehow we can improve the mental health outreach that our police department does. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you. Um, all right, so the next person is Lily P. Hi, um, my name is Lily and I'm from Florence, Northampton. I forgot the word. Um, I'm here to tell my own personal story as a youth. Um, during a mental health crisis, the cops were almost called on me by a family member who was not aware of any other mental health supporters or services. I'm here to ask that me and people like me get the support they need, peer-led and community-based intervention and conflict de-escalation is what I'm asking for beyond social services that are not accountable to me and beyond cops that are armed and that I am at least partially justifiable afraid of. Um, I think it's very important that we go above and beyond to care for, especially, I guess, kids that have mental issues and don't really have a lot of experience beyond this person is armed, this person is twice my size, I'm currently having a mental breakdown, and I do not know how to react besides running away, which when people like me have run away, they've at least outside of Northampton, gotten shot multiple times. Um, and that's obviously a fear that I have and why I think it's inappropriate for cops to respond to mental health situations and why peer-led intervention is needed. All right, thank you very much. Um, so the next person is uh, Rye Buckley. Hello. I want to thank all of you again for all your great work and your hard work. I'd like to start out by commending the work of the Outreach Commission. I think they've done a really great job and a really thoughtful job. And I want to particularly commend them for bringing in community members to talk about how to reach out to community members. Um, I see that more discussion of outreach is on the agenda for tonight's meeting. And I want to just so remind everyone and encourage everyone to think about how the purpose of this outreach is to bring in voices that have not been heard um, in these meetings so far and continue to not be because of structural and other barriers. Um, and then I would also like to talk a little bit about the various possibilities for responding to mental health crises. Um, police training has uh, largely been found to be ineffective. And I think everyone agrees that we need a better way to respond to mental health crises. I'd like to repropose the idea that we find individuals, professionals, peers, entirely outside of the police department to respond to these calls. Um, the city of Brattleboro, Vermont recently had a commission very similar to this one, and they just published their final uh, report. Um, if any commissioners or community members here haven't seen that yet, I highly encourage you check it out. Um, I want to read one particular excerpt um, from that, the key, repi uh, key findings and recommendations from that report. Um, here we go. We encountered no evidence that police participation in mental health crisis response, including the police social worker liaison program, both listening in both listening and system review of available data is reducing incarceration or hospitalization. The existence of an embedded police social worker expands the reach of policing and mental health, which the police themselves have recently lament lamented and which neurodivergent and psychiatrically labeled, um, psychiatrically disabled and self-identified um, respondents uh, resoundingly opposed. Um, there's more, but
but the point I really want to you know bring home and is I want to encourage you all to think about options for crisis response and responses like these um, outside of the police because I believe that is what um, the people who are in these situations really want. Thank you. Um, thank you. That's all. All right. Thank you. And the next person is Ya Peng. Hi again, uh, thank you all so, so much for the many, many hours you're putting into this again. Um, I wanted to um, reiterate some points that other people have made, um, starting with uh, that I, I hope the commission can um, listen to organizations and abolitionist organizers and academics who have been doing abolition work for over 20 years. And one I wanted to name was Critical Resistance. And in case people aren't familiar with it, um, Critical Resistance was formed in 1997 when activists challenging the idea that imprisonment and policing are a solution for social, political, and economic problems came together to organize a conference that examined and challenged what we have come to call the prison industrial complex. So in 1998, the conference brought together over 3,500 activists, academics, former and current prisoners, labor leaders, religious organizations, feminists, gay, lesbian, transgender activists, youth, family, and policymakers from literally every state and other countries. Um, and included in the founders of Critical Resistance are Angela Davis and Ruth Wilson Gilmore. Um, and Critical Resistance says very clearly, as it has has been for a long time that training and community oversight boards do not work. They, they're very clear on that. There's a lot of data to back this up. Um, I just wanted to remind the commission that the lead abolitionist organizers and thinkers have stated this unequivocally. Um, so I've, I've heard some of the commission talk about training and oversight board and some community members talk about this, but what people who have been on the ground doing this work for decades are saying is that it does not work and that a very simple, easy path to creating the kind of community that I think we all really want is to simply invest our resources and support into institutions which are um, accountable to the people that they are meant to serve and that treat people in the ways in which they want to be treated, which um, I think we um, are all like learning through the commission and public testimony for mental health ends up being peer led initiatives um, and not traditional social service agencies. And on that note, I wanted to um, mention a webinar called Abolish Policing, Not Just Police that was put out over the summer um, with Mariam Kaba and two journalists, um, Maya Shanwar and Victoria Law, who wrote a book called Prison by Any Other Name. And um, the description is, as we stand on the precipice of so much potential change, there's an understandable impulse to reach for replacements, institutions to fill in for police and prisons. Yet we can't simply call for social workers to replace police. As we fight to defund or abolish police and imprisonment, we need to be wary of ways that strengthen other forms of surveillance and control. Um, and yes, so, um, we do not want to replicate many of the same oppressive dynamics as traditional policing. And um, I think the uh, outreach committee started discussing this. Um, but one phrase that I've heard is we want alternatives to policing, not alternative policing. Um, and that was your time. great. Um, that was like a great one to end on. Thank you. Um, is there anyone else that would like to make a comment before we move on from this? Okay. So I'm not seeing any, so we'll move on to um, the next item in the agenda, which is introducing our newest commission member, uh, Chris Banks. Um, so Chris has been appointed to the commission. Uh, he's joining us tonight for his first full meeting. Um, but Chris, if you want to say hi. Hello. Uh, it's a pleasure to engage in this work with you all. Um, I'm looking forward to it. It's gonna, I know it's going to be a lot, uh, but I think that uh, we could come up with some good ideas. And um, like I said, I'm, I'm just really looking forward to digging into this with you all. All right, awesome. Um, so Chris will likely be joining the um, policies and services uh, subcommittee as oh. well. Oh, oh, actually, uh, I was thinking of uh, considering the outreach committee. Is that is that uh, at all possible? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you're not limited either. You could do both. You could do either. <laughs> 
um, in that sense, we, we haven't had like a strict, you must join um, policy. Um, all right, uh, related to that, we'll move on to the next agenda. I don't know, okay, we're getting folks back in as well. Um, so we'll move on to the next agenda item, as, which is related to that, which is the update on co-chairs as well. Um, so we now have a, um, sorry, we, we have a member, um, Councillor Shiara is still looking through folks, um, but as we know that there's no more women of color who are parents and there are no more women of color in general within the pool. Um, so finding replacements is not easy working to maintain um, any of the, the balances that we have at the moment or that we had before folks left. Um, we do have one open position, sorry, one open commission position, um, and we also have an open co-chair position. Um, and after the last meeting, um, Cynthia had reached out um, and great, uh, graciously volunteered. Um, so I would like to move that we appoint Cynthia as a, as a co-chair um, as well. Second. All right, and Cynthia, are you okay with that as well? Yeah, it was a tough election, but I'm uh, very, very proud to serve. Thank you so much. Yeah. Excellent. I just want to check in. All right. So um, just as before, we'll go through a really quick vote uh, for this. So Noah, can you count us off? Yes. Uh, Lois? Yep. Elizabeth? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, not here. Um, Booker, I think, is still not here. Um, Dan? Yes. Nick? Yes, thank you, Cynthia. <laughs> um, David? Yes. Alex? Yes. Javier? Yes. Namdi? Yes. Michael? Yes. Obi? Yes. Carol? Yes. Chris? And yes. Uh, yes. Cynthia, too. We got to weigh in. <laughs> I'll abstain. <laughs> awesome thank you all all right so that po uh, that passes and we now have a new co-chair so congratulations to cynthia and thank you so much <laughs> um all right and that leads us to our next item which is the announcements of speakers for commissions or subcommittees if anyone has speakers who are uh, going to up uh, going to attend. This is the place to announce that so that everyone is on the same page and can join if they need to or they would like to. Does anyone have a speaker announcement? Um, oh, sorry, Javier. Uh, I just want to clarify. We still, if you know, if tomorrow we find out somebody who is incredible who should be coming, we can just send an email and check with you and inform the rest of the commission right it's not that this is the moment to in we, if we don't decide anybody that's it it's not that yes so this was just a space so that if there were folks who were coming everybody would know about it and to make it easier to um to reach out to them and to um i'm sure that would make it easier for people to know that they needed to go to that meeting if they were interested in that topic and they had the ability to that was all so it was just this is just in place or not in place of but in addition to emails and Lois? Um, I recommended, I think at least three or four times now, um, Elisa Klein to speak to the commission. Yep. And so I'm just saying it again. Yeah, I've reached out to her twice and she hasn't responded yet. Um, Thank so, you. Um, but if she does, or if she wants, we also invited her to the Monday meeting of the um, outreach committee and haven't, didn't hear back. Um, but it was also fairly short notice, so we'll keep reaching out. And if if she uh, if she wants to or anybody else does, we'll make an announcement here too. Um, any other announcements? All right, then we're going to move on, and this is a discussion item brought to us by Lois um, around gender equality and its implications for the commission work and the current uh, commission composition. Um, I'd like to read something that I wrote. Um, so 
The commission is rightfully focused on the policing of black people and people of color. The commission's charge is to quote, transform how the city delivers policing services while ensuring community safety equitably and just, justly for all, end quote. We all agree We all agree that when we address policing, we must focus on its consequences and harm to black people and people of color. On the city of Northampton website, it says of the commission composition, the commission shall include representation of not less than eight members who are black indigenous people of color or from other historically marginalized communities who have been targeted and harmed by US policing practices, end quote. Although not specified, women, most especially marginalized and criminalized women, are, are one of the communities who have been and are harmed by policing. Despite the fact that 58% of Northampton residents are female, there is now a large gender imbalance on the commission, 10 men and four women. Given this gender imbalance going forward, I ask the commissioners to be vigilant so that the ideas of women are fully recognized and considered. And crucially, I ask the commission to explore how policing differently impacts women, including policing responses to domestic and sexual violence, stalking, the treatment of elderly women, and the particular and damaging contempt and shaming of women who use substances women who are criminalized for sex work, and any woman who becomes entangled and harmed by the criminal legal system. We all are informed and impacted by sexism and misogyny. It's my hope as the commission moves forward in the next 10 weeks or so, that in addition to alternatives to policing for people experiencing emotional crises and people who are unhoused, that the commission will focus on how the NPD responds to domestic and sexual violence as well as sexual, uh, sexual substance use. That is, as I've said before, the lives lived behind closed doors. And that in addition to racism, that sexism and homophobia and transphobia be integrated into the lens by which we do our work. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, does anyone have um, anything they'd like to add to that um, as part of a discussion? Uh, Cynthia, or sorry, um, oh, Carol. <laughs> Hi there. Um, so thank you, Lois, for that. Uh, it's been weighing on my mind for a number of weeks um, that when I entered, uh, when I was asked to, um, come to the commission by the uh, president of the city council. Um, I did not know I was at that point uh, replacing uh, a, a, lat a Latino, a Latina. And uh, right now uh, in what Lois was uh, describing of the, the balance, the demographic balance here, um, you know, I do have, I share this concern that um, we're morphing towards, um, the, the, the commission is morphing towards representation of, um, people who are not necessarily um, having, you know, lived experience or not, you know, intimate knowledge of um, it, it, really what we're focusing on here, which is the uh, response of this community to the most vulnerable uh, community residents. So, I mean, it's certainly possible that those of us who are, you know, who live in more privileged circumstances can um, really you know, wrap our heads around what the, the needs of the most vulnerable people are in this town. And that's part of the outreach effort um, is connecting with those folks and making sure that their uh, narrative can come in here. Uh, but on the other hand, I just think, I'm, I'm not sure there's a solution here, by the way, but I just want to uh, mark this moment as, um, you know, the story of the commission and who sits on it and how it has transformed itself since September or October um, is a story in and of itself, which is which is a valid and valuable story to tell. And I would certainly hope 
that um, that there's a piece in our final report that uh, that that addresses that story because I, I think it's very much a a parallel uh, process with uh, you know the the um, the difficulty in getting voices in here that need to be heard. So uh, Lois and then Josie. Uh, well, I, I just want to respond to that. My, my point is that uh, that policing is different for women because of sexism and misogyny. And that is something that the whole commission needs to recognize when we think about policing. So that, that is my point, uh, which what, whatever, the, whatever the makeup of the commission is, uh, by gender or race or ethnicity, it that it's important that the commission as a whole use this as another lens, just like we use the lens of um, the policing in relation to black people, in relation to people of color, that we have to use it also in relation to um, women and, and girls, but especially women, because a huge part of policing that goes on is in relation to what we now call domestic violence, which is largely violence against women, sexual violence, which is largely um, violence against women. And I think when we use these terms like domestic violence, sexual violence, we like de-gender them or whatever that word might be and take away the impact of looking at the impact of who this is actually happening to and how the police deal with this. And I feel like this has been, I've tried to bring it up in different ways and I feel like, you know, I, I haven't been heard. And so, um, and I, partly I think I haven't been heard, I hate to say it just because I haven't used this word in like 30 years, sexism. And so um, I think we need to really look at this. And I think given the makeup of the population and who gets policed or who interacts with police or who the inter police interact with, I think it's really important that this be included in, in the lens, in the prism, in the way we think about policing, because that's a lot of where policing is. And it's not happening on the street. I mean, except for women that are doing sex work. But I mean, I think I work with a lot of criminalized women. And every single one of them can tell a story of the type of shame and stigma and degradation that they suffer at the hands of police. Josie? Yeah, I just want to, I definitely want to echo um, the things that Lois said about um, not only the makeup of the commission, but the way that uh, um, feminine bodies are policed in general, and not to mention that, like, the, the history of Northampton being a very uh, queer community as well. We also have to keep in mind that there's also a, a, a fairly large trans community as well, and where that kind of intersects with policing. Uh, speaking from a non-binary point of view and how that has kind of shaped my lens. I also think uh, that there has been kind of a shift from the commission's makeup uh, to something uh, resembling a little bit more of the current power hierarchies that exist within our society. Um, and that I feel, uh, I also feel like there's this nagging sense of, um, I. So having sat on this commission for the last few months, uh, you know, I felt like there's been a lot of really fruitful discussion about, you know, the intersections of sex and policing and race. But there's also a huge sense of powerlessness uh, that I feel like will only go away once the commission moves towards more radical, broad sweeping changes that we need to see because we know that anything that we recommend is going to be negotiated later. So I think we should push for more radical things, including, um, getting as many perspectives from um, not only the trans community and the poor community, but also uh, women in the community. Uh, all of that being said, I feel like uh, there is a level of 
tokenization that at the very least I feel, and it feels weird wanting this commission to push toward more radical broad sweeping changes. And then also sitting on the commission that is constantly feeling or appearing as if it's it's uh, like police apologists and pushing more towards reform rather than abolition. And it at, at the every day at the end of these meetings, I kind of feel like I, I don't want my name attached to this if it's just going to reinforce a cycle of oppression and white supremacy that we see over and over again as the as the police commissions make up continues to slowly morph into that. Uh, I'm starting to have reservations myself. That being said, I would never relinquish my spot on the commission because I do believe in the work that we are doing and really hope for this commission to continue to make progressive shifts toward abolition rather than reform. Because uh, once again, um, there's a bunch of uh, empirical data out there that suggests that reform is not the answer. Thank you, um, Javier. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Cool. So I, I just want to voice uh, a little more what um, Joyce was saying. You know, at the end of the day, <laughs> whether, whether I like it or not, the commission ended up being a reflection of Northampton. And that's, that, that's not good. In the same way how early on we, I commented that in downtown Northampton, you don't see people of color hanging around going, you know, here and there. If you see a person of color in downtown, they are going as quick as they can from point A to point B. And that's what they are. I mean, if anybody's surprised uh, that we are now in a super majority uh, white commission, it was not paying attention. With that being said, would I like <coughs> that the experience of the people of color for whom the system has not necessarily worked uh, those voices should be heard more and not, you know, I came here 12, I came to the U.S. 12 years ago without knowing English or anything. And I came to Northampton and, you know, early on I learned that in Northampton you're going to find a pretty good amount of white people who are going to tell you what you need to know. And that they are going to feel that when they are telling you something, you're being blessed by their knowledge, right? This sort of cult of personality in the region. And... And I think that we need to be conscious of that. I'm the one with others here that has to have an extra knowledge, piece of knowledge to be able to survive a police encounter. We are the ones who go through that. And one of the things that I don't see in this commission is uh, a knowledge of that, a knowledge of privilege, a knowledge of inter interest that has been created either for organizations that they need for this status quo to keep going or for people who work for those organizations for years that need that this status quo to keep going and think not to change a lot. I voice JC when he says that we should be more radical in what we're asking because at the end of the day, this is going to be negotiated if in the best case scenario is going to be negotiated. All right, thank you. And uh, Josie? Yeah, I, and like to that, a part of the sense of, of powerlessness that I feel even being on this commission comes from the fact that I don't think that we've asked enough of our, uh, no offense to Alex and Michael, of course, of our uh, city councilors and of the mayor to, to explicitly, uh, you know, allocate those funds to a separate account, right? The, not only are we putting in a lot of work toward this commission, but we must hold them accountable to, at, at the very least, providing the foundation for us to properly do our work. Um, and part of that has has come from um, the city councilors, uh, thankfully, cutting uh, that 10%. Even though personally, I believe it should have been more. Um, but we need to push for the for the mayor to to real not only restore the the potential loss of. Uh, those fundings, but to, to reallocate them as immediately as possible in order for us to properly, not only properly do what we've been charged to do, but to hold um, the police accountable, to hold uh, the mayor accountable and the to be mayor accountable and to hold the city um, councilors accountable. Because that's what we've all been here to do. Uh, so Michael, and then I'm gonna also sort of try and redirect this back to 
the discussion topic, which is making sure that we're including um, sex and gender in terms of what we're looking at and what we're considering in this as well, because that's part of this. So I just want to redirect that as well. Uh, Michael? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to, um, to, to, to kind of soak in what Lois said for a minute, because I, I think it's so important. I think, um, you know, I, I think if I, if I read the room correctly in terms of identifying um, everyone, uh, I see that it, there is a great gender imbalance here on this commission. And so I think um, that, that kind of the understanding of what the information is that we're trying to take in as a group and what the, how that will impact our recommendations, um, you know, has to be, has to be considered. And so I, I, I pledge to Lois that, that, you know, I hear you and I think what you've said is extremely important and, and true and honest. Um, I did want to mention to the commission as a group here that um, I, I know we're all getting emails. I'm getting uh, emails as a city councilor and exchanged emails today that were really unfortunate with a resident here who doesn't see the value of this commission, um, doesn't see the value of people in, in our in our position, in our place here in Northampton, a, a relatively safe community, looking at opportunities to create a safer community, specifically identifying issues that need to be cared for specifically, uh, not necessarily like, like one of our uh, public commenters mentioned, a call the cops society. There are, there is a, a, a there is an opportunity here. And so I, I feel I felt bad about the way the exchange went with this person today because they don't see the value of the compassion in our work here. And so to the commissioners, I say, keep going, keep working. We're doing the right thing here. Uh, let's find the right choices for Northampton. All right. Um, I'm just going to jump in as well, because one of the things that's come up and um, and sort of, and we'll talk about this, but when we think about what our recommendations are, um, we wanna think broadly about what those are, but we also wanna establish, at least I want to, and I don't wanna say we as a group, we haven't necessarily talked about all this, but whatever recommendation we have really needs to have a point or a, 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 whatever it is, but the part of the process of establishing it, of measuring, of, of understanding whether or not those improvements made the right changes, part of that also has to be bringing in um, and bringing folks in to do a reevaluation um, at some point sort of to say, did this accomplish what we needed to? We have nine months, we're gonna miss something. Um, I can guarantee it. Um, so also to look and say, what did we miss? And so I'm not saying like, oh, this is our get out of jail free card. We don't have to think about gender now. That's not what I mean, but that also to think about what are the processes um, that we could put in place and establish in these recommendations that we have to make sure that if we underestimated something, if we didn't do something, um, you know, in, in this, that, that we, we still create a space for voices that are unheard. So that if we make a recommendation and it's not hitting right for people, um, and you know we talked about gender, race, um, we haven't really talked about people um, looking at different immigrant statuses, um, right? So that's something we might miss. There are tons of other identities that I'm going to miss, tons of other parts of this. Um, but thinking about what can we do to make sure that there's a reevaluation point and a reassessment point so that whatever we do recommend can be adjusted um, to be more inclusive, right? So that there's always an iteration and an improvement. Um, so thinking about that as well, and specifically in this case about gender, making that really clear um, and explicit. Um, all right, any other comments or thoughts that folks would like to make on this? Um, Cynthia and then Carol. Um, yeah, just trying to redirect again. Um, I enjoyed Lois's metaphor of lens and prisms. And um, we all have them. And I want to learn from everyone's lens and prisms that I don't have. Um, but at the same time, the male dominance in the group, which is not much we can do about it, 
it's going to bring a certain lens and prism. And so I'm just asking all of us to check ourselves and to listen and to respect one another um, and to continue with the process, as Michael said, and um, also that um, some of the lenses are abolition and some of the lenses are reform. And uh, I hope we can just maintain a place where we can hear all those and get to a place where we can um, have some recommendations that we can believe in and a process that we can believe in. Um, but thank you, Lois, for, for raising this particular issue um, because it's so important. All right, and then, um, so Carol and then Namdi. Yeah, I just wanted to add that the outreach subcommittee is actively looking at ways to um, make it safe enough to get testimony from people in the survivor community. And that would be uh, include domestic or interpersonal abuse experiences, as well as sexual assault. Um, and there, there are some particular um, protocols when it comes to, you know, um, sur survivor advocacy organizations that uh, do not want to violate uh, confidentiality by identifying individuals, but there may be a way for our subcommittee to um, send to these organizations the flyers with the questions that we have. Um, and then they could be circulated and it would be up to individuals who would like to share their experience of exposure to policing around their um, the situations of vulnerability. So there, there may be, you know, I guess I'm responding to Lois's, you know, very important concern about uh, where's the lens around women who are um, most at risk um, we, we are actively trying to access some of those voices. I, um, I have the impression that the women of color that were on our commission that are no longer on the commission, um, in part left their role because of structural factors built into the process of how we've been doing our work, you know, so the time at night that this work happens, the amount of time it's been taking, um, I understand, and, and again, I'd be happy to be corrected if I'm wrong about this, but it strikes me that it directly impacts uh, people who are engaged with parenting young children. Um, if, um, so if you're a person of a certain age, and this tends to fall on women more, um, women of color you know, may have extra dynamics that make the burden extra heavy. So I guess I just wanna think about the fact that the very nature of, of this process, the way it's set out, the, the, the enormous amount of time that it's, it's asking um, has made it more difficult for certain people to continue in their role here. Um, and I don't know, I don't think you know, much can be done, done about that. Maybe, maybe something can be done. Maybe there is some creative way to think about this. But one thing that occurred to me is that since there already has been uh, such a, a, an effort in vetting um, certain people who, who now left the commission, um, whether there's a way to re-engage those people in a role that was much less time consuming. Um, so for example, I would welcome, you know, um, thinking about some of these commissioners who have left, um, having some kind of editorial role on um, some of the products that come out of the group that they could sort of weigh, weigh be, you know, invited to weigh in uh, in some way that wouldn't be violating of the public rules. Maybe they could do so in some sort of public setting on their own time. But I think thinking creatively about how um, if we agree that there are structural aspects, just the very nature of the way this work proceeds, which, you know, again, I strike, it just strikes me that, it, you know, I mean, my view is it's just an enormous amount of time to ask anybody to put in. Um, and I understand that it, it, you know, this, is, this has led people to decide not to continue. So it's not an accident that we don't have women on the commission, but that there, uh, there's some structural factors that have made it very difficult for particular women to continue with our work. So anyway, I just, I just wonder whether we could brainstorm some ways to re-engage people who've already invested time mm -hmm. um, in a way that respects the reasons why they couldn't continue in, in, the, you know, in the format that um, you know, the rest of us are doing. That's just a thought. Um, Josie, and then I'll jump in and respond. Sure, sure, sure. I think, I think part of it 
is that quite simply this commission is a huge responsibility and a huge time commitment and it's it's uncompensated uh you know when we talk about getting these these diverse voices, we also need to be thinking about the socioeconomic impacts of what it means to be able to sit on this commission. Um, you know, and if you are working paycheck to paycheck, right, and you want to make a difference, and you are part of these marginalized groups, as we know that uh, people of color tend to be within lower economic uh, situations uh, for, uh, for so many different reasons, um, it feels like that some of this work, quite frankly, should have been compensated. Uh, especially if you wanted to keep those voices of those people who, you know, did have families, who were working jobs, uh, who couldn't make the later nights that uh, suit so many of our lifestyles as we see it right now. Uh, that was just my two cents. Yeah, so um, not to go too far off topic, um, but I did reach out to um, a, a number of different organizations for in the, in response to that. So following through, only one of them actually responded. It was the Markham Nathan Fund. Um, and in terms of like, could we provide either grants to uh, people who needed it or that could incentivize them that would allow them to reorganize or reshuffle some of the things going on in their lives so that they could participate? Um, or is it something like offering childcare services and things like that? Um, and Unfortunately for um, for them, that's sort of outside of what they they do, right? They're looking to fund grassroots organizations, um, and this commission work doesn't fit into that. Um, but uh, one of the things that that does sort of come up there, and we talked about this, you know, in different ways, is how do you inc increase participation? And so one of the things the city council is looking at is sort of providing you know childcare and other ways to improve participation from these groups, not to say that, you know, no one can have and can understand um, like the roles of pol that police play in, in lived experiences if you're a person of color or if you're a woman, right? We can all understand those because we can listen, um, but having those voices and making space for them in an intentional way is important. So still trying to compile a list of everything um, in terms of creating sort of an appendix of here's how here's how we think you might be able to improve um you know commission select committee joint commission work within the city um so including things like offering money child care um, options um offering different ways to um, have meetings at different times so that it's not always at bedtime for young children, um, that it's not always at dinner time or things like that. And it's gonna take a lot to sort of figure out how we overcome or recommend how a small group can overcome sort of the structural, the structural um, impediments to that, but we'll figure it out um, and make some, some sort of recommendation based on what we learn as well. Um, all right on that um so now we're at or does anyone have any other comments here okay uh so i'm going to move us along to um the outreach and um the outreach subcommittee and then talking about public hearings as well um javier do you want to lead us off sure um, um, so the outreach subcommittee has met twice. The last time was yesterday at noon. Um, the, our first meeting last week, we were able to create a sort of the first draft of the outreach document, which delineates the ba basis, sort of the, um, the floor for the kind of questions and how we want to be able to communicate with affected communities and people who are the most affected by over policing. Um, the Carol did an incredible work uh, with the first creating the first draft. Um, and yesterday we did uh, an open workshop with advocates, any community member that was able to come. And we have now what hopefully is going to be close to this final version of the outreach document. What we're looking with the outreach document is for anybody in the community, um, in the commission or service providers to be able to take that document, follow the guidelines, and for the, that person or that 
service provider to be able to collect testimony in a way that is going to be respectful of uh, the individual's experience, but also uh, being aware that the safety of this person is paramount during this process. Um, Carol, do you want to talk a little more? Because I mean, I'm you know, most of the things that I'm saying is things that you have brought to the table during our meetings. Okay, so it is indeed a privilege to be able to connect with someone who has an experience of vulnerability and and probably some trauma history to really um, have that person share their narrative. So it is a gift and it is, uh, we're aware of that. So I think that the subcommittee was very well aware that we needed to have a, what Javier was calling a one pager that we hand to a person and let them know that um, they are free to share what they want to share and they can even, um, later change their mind and say, you know, really don't want my narrative out there, even anonymously. And so our, our the one page document that Javier is uh, referring to um, is in more traditional research, I guess you would call it a consent form. But, um, you know, we expanded, you know, what was and, and word did a lot of wordsmithing with the um, with the assistance of uh, active uh, um, advocates, community ad advocates yesterday so that uh, it was perfectly clear what the rights of the person, uh, what, you know, whoever whoever was sharing a narrative, uh, what the rights were. And um, so we will largely, I guess our process will largely be to distribute this one page um, description of what this commission is, what the outreach effort is, uh, how it fits, you know, we want people's lived experience of uh, situations where there was exposure to Northampton police. And, um, you know, I, the ending note is we want, uh, we want people who are participating to let us know what their view is, their expert view um, of what would help them to feel safer in this community as a community member. Um, so, do you want to say more, Javier? Sure. So the idea, um, so Dan, can you paste the link and and make it shareable, if you can, please, so the the rest of the commission can can go and take a look. So we we are setting basic parameters for this. Testimonies can be record audio recorded, via the recorded, or can can be written down. Um. With this document, people like Lois, like myself, uh, Alex, and others are going to be able to do the outreach that we have been waiting to be able to do. This uh, document is also going to be used by advocates, organizers, and anybody who has access to those communities to be able to gather the 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 testimonies. Uh, Dan just put the link on the chat. So uh, w one of the things during this meeting, and only during this meeting, your, what we are going to ask you as a subcommittee is to take a look to it. Uh, we work a lot into this document and we work hand-to-hand uh, -hand with advocates creating this document. Take a look, see anything that you think could be added. The idea in my wish is to have this deployed as soon as possible. Uh, we don't have a lot of time. My My position is that we should be able to deploy this as soon as possible and have in the next public hearing uh, meeting that we're going to have soon uh, the first batch of documents uh, the uh, testimonies that are going to be collected using this form so please uh, take a look to the document uh, make any notes don't change uh, just make notes on the side and if you see anything that is a red flag for you, feel free to, to write it there. But also, if that's a red flag, just email me. So we I we go straight into that in our next meeting. Uh, and if you have any question, um, I don't know, if you have any question about uh, the work that we're doing or the document, just let me know. Chris, would it be helpful to... Um 
just in general show um, to share screens or to um, to read through this sure. if anyone has trouble. I think it's a good idea. All right. Um, I will, I guess, just share my screen so that people, people can see the first page. There are two pages to this. Uh, the first page is the sort of general information. Um, so, um, who, like, what we're, what we're looking, oops, sorry, just realized it didn't share. There we go. Um, so what we're looking to, um, to get from people, um, in terms of information, um, that it, we just want their, their testimony, um, that if they're doing this, um, we want to sort of reiterate that we're not saying that anyone is guilty, that we're not making judgments about what, what they did or didn't do, what led to their interactions or didn't lead to nothing like that. We just want to hear about their, um, their experiences. Um, but that we do want to share this with the members of the Policing Review Commission, that it will be, uh, that there's a chance that it could be played in public, that it could be read out loud, that it's part of the sort of public record and what that means. Um, and our goal is to, um, as a commission, we do not have, we are not the city council, we do not have to identify anyone. Um, so what we're doing is just leaving the option for people to um, be anonymous when they do these. So if you reach, if you reach out to someone and they say, I only want to make a statement if it can be anonymous, don't attribute their name and sort of de-identify as much as possible. Um, we also want to um, reiterate that there's not a benefit to doing this. Part of this is that they, these are going out to um, different um, advocacy groups in, in addition to individuals. And we wanna make sure that nobody's like getting something that, that no one's being promised um, services for saying a particular thing or even taking part in this. We don't want that to be, you know, you'll get or be denied services um, by, by speaking. Um, um, and that, you know, we do want it, um, if someone does open up um, and they speak with us or they give a statement, uh, but that that statement becomes damaging to them, that they realize they might have overshared, um, you know, for whatever reason, uh, because it is really easy. You might think that you're being, you know, you've de-identified something enough, but somebody could listen and go, oh, I know exactly what that is. We're a small town. There's only 30,000 people. Um, and so if that happens, um, that we will remove that, that request or that statement um, to the best of our ability from, from where it lives. In addition to that, we do have some recommendations, um, including just sort of, um, and I can, I can zoom in, I see people are making uh, squinty faces. Give me a second here. Oops, and let's just go 150. Um, might be a little big, let's see if we can get this. Um, but that we wanna make sure that everyone is being as respectful as possible. They're not judging people. Um, that if someone doesn't want to answer a question, there's only five questions, but if someone doesn't want to, if they show hesitation, don't pressure them, just move on. Um, there's no right or right, wrong answer. We wanna listen really carefully um, and repeat back answers and confirm what I heard you say was blank is that correct um, that's especially important if you're taking notes or you're writing down responses for somebody if they're giving you that verbal response but they're not being recorded um, and again we state that there's nothing there's no benefit to them the, no, no material benefit um, and no penalties for either um, expressing things or not participating um, our goal uh, and one of the things that we're still looking we're still developing is to have a sort of local resource flyer that you can give to people to make sure if they're talking about things without any judgments, without any advice, just say this is part of, you know, these are the services that are available in Northampton at the moment and give them that just in case they need to connect, maybe that'll help. Um, you know, um, so we have that and then um, respondents making sure that they're in control of their, nar their narrative that you let them know that they can remove those. They just need to let you know if you're the primary contact or they can reach out to anyone on the outreach um, subcommittee and we will do that work. And then the five questions that we have are, can you describe a recent experience interacting with the Northampton police or another crisis response social service or support organization in Northampton? What, what brought about your interaction with that organization? 
In what ways did that experience make you feel more or less safe? Have you had an Sorry, have you had additional experiences with the Northampton Police Department or another crisis response social service or support organization in Northampton that you would like to talk about? And if so, what are they? And then what would make you feel safe in Northampton? So really broad questions. Um, and this is one of the, the things that's gonna take us a while, I think, is to, you know, just like after the public, com um, public hearings, is to sort of disentangle all of that. <laughs> Um, and understand sort of what the different um, uh, what what the different moving pieces are. What are the major themes and things like that? Um, Chris. Yes. Um, so uh, I have a question. Considering both uh, the safety of the respondent and considering COVID nineteen. Um, how are we planning to disseminate the consent form? So um, there's, there's a couple different ways that I was thinking of. So one would be having a digital form. Um, so a digital version of that, but also recognizing that this is not a, um, the part of the, the reason that we're doing some of this is that people don't necessarily have access to technology and the internet and all the things that they need. Uh, so we'll also be working to have print out like physical copies of that as well um, that can be brought to different organizations or they can pick them up um, because it's a digital piece here. If organizations wanted to print it out themselves so they have it on hand, they could do that as well too. Um, but also let Javier go and then Lois and then Nick, I saw your hands up too. Yeah, just to so just to clarify, so the the way how we're hoping to do it, it's the most basic with people using their own network to be able to do it. With people, so just sitting when we met with the advocates, they were talking about probably using hard copies of this and working with people, maybe having people record audio of the of answering all these questions, and after that, send us the file. In relationship to COVID, I mean that can happen with social distancing, without with without any problem, right? As long as people are using wearing masks and keeping distance, uh, that shouldn't be a problem. And in cases where you know, in places like Safe Passage and others that may or not may be able to do it, if they do it because of the setup that they have, they may be in a better condition. Um, to deploy this with people that they are living in in different facilities owned by this organization. All right. So, uh, um, Carol, did you have a response to that? Yes, I, I knew. I thought Lois had had some response too, but maybe this will clarify. Um, so, in my conversations with several organizations that are advocates and uh, for uh, women survivors, uh, they reminded me that it's against their protocol, their practice to identify or, or you know, or recruit people to, for, any for any purpose. And so the method of reaching out, of outreach through those organizations would be simply to have this kind of document or, or, or a smaller, flyer um, posted on their website for anyone who reads their website um, to, to um, respond directly with submission of a testimony, that there really wouldn't be any such practice as a, uh, a counselor, an advocate within these organizations saying to a survivor, hey, would you like to share your story about your experience with the police when such and such happened? Uh, that's really against their protocol. So we'll have to work differently around, around uh, those situations. All right, Lois and then Nick. I, I can't see that first page, but I noticed on the first page where it says that the commission is made up of citizens and I, I just hope that we can get rid of not be using that word. Why can't we say, I mean, I don't think there's any citizenship requirement to be on the commission. I think we're talking about residents. 
and um, I think it's good as a practice to uh, use that word resident instead of a citizen, unless we really mean citizen. Like there, you know, you must be a citizen to do X. Um, the, the thing about, I just wonder about the safe passage thing, if, if they put it on their website and if women respond um, and they respond to some staff person at safe passage, if that person can just, um, you know, take off any identifying names or anything and just send the responses instead of the name of the person and the response. If, you know, if there could be some cooperation if they can put that out there and say, I, counselor so-and-so will be in charge of collecting these things and, and um, you know, just basically wiping them clean of identifying whatever, not just names, but maybe like, you know, date or, you know, things that might actually uh, work to identify some somebody. And if, if there could be that kind of cooperation, um, then, uh, and I think the same thing could be true about um, undocumented people where there's a, a, a point person that can ask the questions or read the questions or have the questions posted and then uh, assemble answers. And yeah, they'll be amalgamated, but if, if, if what we're looking for is what, what people's experience is cumulatively rather than specifically, I mean, we're not gonna be naming some specific police officer, um, then uh, they, I think it's okay that they don't, you know, I think most people aren't going to want to use their names anyway. So just to respond, good suggestion and um, that keeps the initiative, keeps the survivor as the initiating party. And that seems to be consistent with their, pra their strong practice. So thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to mention that as long as the staff person is not the one initiating anything, it's it's fine. And in relationship to undocumented folks, um, so it's going to be a little more complicated from the point of view of language, right? And that's one of the things that I'm working on with, because, you know, my main main job with ACLU is with undocumented immigrants in 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 Massachusetts so I'm trying to so this is an a, an issue that I'm going to bring to the subcommittee next week in relationship to uh, gathering testimony in Spanish or Creole or any other language that is not English and having to translate that okay um so Nick, and then um, I'm looking here, and then Lois, I don't know if you re raised your hand again. The same for Chris. I don't know if you raised your hand again. Um, so we'll go Nick, and then Lois and Chris are open this up. Um, this is a, it's a nicely done and very thorough document. I'm trying to understand the process a little more clearly. Are you, are we going to be asking uh, uh, staff, staff people at these various uh, agencies and programs to notify the, con the, the people who use their services and to take the, to, to be collecting the, the, the accounts and the, the reports from people is, is, is that, and then they will submit it to the commission. I, I'm just trying to understand who's taking in, who, who's doing the interview and taking in the report. So, um, unless anyone else wants to respond, I will be happy to. 
Uh, well, I can just sort of start the answer. If I left anything out, you can take it from there then. Um, so the idea is the, the, the sub, so these documents are going to have the contact info for us, right? So whoever, uh, gives the testimony. So for example, if you have somebody, if I have somebody who is an organizing, who is taking a testimony from an undoc undocumented person in Florence, right? That person is, that undocumented person is going to get the document, hopefully translated. Is gonna read it. They are gonna get all the way to the to the bottom to the questions. In that point, you decide in which form the testimony is gonna be, right? Either video, audio, or written. Let's say for the sake of making it easy, audio. You're gonna record it in in your cell phone. Um. After the in, after the interview ends, the idea is that the person who committed to do the outreach on the ground, be an organization or advocate or organizer, uses the contact information to deliver the testimony. There may be, I mean, we still need to, we have one more meeting next week where we probably are gonna talk more in detail how that process is gonna look, but uh, that's so far my understanding then yeah, so there's there's a twofold part of this. So one is going to be, is this being, you know, because we also want to give people agency. So if they have access to the tools and they want to make a submission as well, um, how they would do that either through email, right, which is something anyone can do at this point, but for also, um, and Noah and I've been sort of pushing at the city and we'll poke again, again, um, you know, because we want to have a page on the, the police commission website, which allows for, um, that access uh, so that people can make a submission on their own so they don't need to go through someone um, so if they wanted to record themselves they could do that if they wanted to yeah, just record audio an audio file or a video file and make a submission so that they can add that to the conversation um, but there's nothing um, that would also say that they couldn't you know submit um, physical mail or if and this is something that we've talked about um, because it works fairly well because we can't do a lot of focus groups and get every you know 30 people in a room um, or 10 people in a room to talk <laughs> about that um, but that's a really good space for pulling out ideas so we want to also leave it up to folks who work with really vulnerable populations um, and who would be really easily identified by the description of their experiences to leave it up to the person to the representative from that group or that individual, if it's a commission member, if you have, if you're talking to five or 10 people, um, to also take what you get from them, but pull out the major themes. What are the major experiences and then highlight them. Um, so really doing a deep read of what you've, what you've got, really be um, invested in that and understanding the narrative because the, the words are not gonna be exactly the same, um, but it could be, um, feelings of powerlessness, or it could be ways that they felt empowered. Um, and so really bringing that. So there's a bunch of different ways that people can can commit to this. Um, it's not as systematic as <laughs> um, as like a real study that has months and months to, to go. Um, so Dan, if I understand you correctly, it's we're going to have this flyer that will explain that will invite participation. And, and then we will ask community uh, contacts, resources, agencies to help us distribute this flyer uh, to people who might want to participate or might be interested, correct? Yes. And would we consider um, putting something in the newspaper? I, 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 that may be more than uh, a full commission discussion, but is that something that's come up? Like ways to publicize this invitation? Has that been, it just hasn't come up. I'm not, I'm not asking you for an answer on it. No, no, it hasn't. Okay, all right, okay. All right, and, so. and, and, and the main reason is because we had been solely focused on um, addressing this issue, working with people who have the connection with affected communities 
and and if starting for good faith, having those organizations, those activists, those advocates reaching out to their network to deploy this. That's 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 literally how we have been talking about this so far. I oh. think publishing in the newspaper is a good idea. Okay. And Javier, one last question. If if uh, if I have some uh, uh, programs, uh, 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 like, for example, you, you're familiar with AFIA, uh, but some programs where I feel like there would be um, people who might have important experiences that they would want to share, who would I who would I let know? So that that we can reach out to them. You mean in the in the subcommittee? Yes. To my to me. Excellent. Thank you. To me and and I and, and something that you just just said previously, Nick. We are super cognizant that an added layer of uh, complication is the fact that it's going to be difficult, and may, I may be wrong, but from my point of view, it's going to it may be difficult for people receiving services from a specific service provider to do an in, to be willing to give an interview if the testimony is going to is going to would leave the service providers in a less than ideal position in in relationship to whatever experience the person had uh that may be, or may be, in, or uh, may be because somebody has a relation with an advocate that that all that testimony is also uh, leaning towards something. I, I that that's something that, at the end of the day, personally, I think we have to live with. And I mean, this so far, this is this sort of this is the best tool and process that we had been able to come out with, um, to be able to bring those voices that we don't have. And hopefully we're going to be able to get to the table. I just your point is well taken because there's a power differential in the agencies, and I I, I think that's a really uh, important uh, thing to note. But there there might be the option for some people to uh, email or phone in and bypass the agency with their account. That's and a I, that's a really good idea. And I and I think that that that. That, that's quite doable. And all they have to do is say, you can do this, we'll know nothing about it, but this is the information on how how to uh, uh, participate. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I mean, we can make clear at the end that if you don't feel comfortable, if you get this flyer, if you get this information and you wanna do it directly with somebody from the commission, call this number or, or reach this. If you feel comfortable doing it with whoever is presenting it to you, you can do it. We can clarify that. And that's a, that's a really, really good point. Thanks, Nick. And that's that sort of leads to what we expected or tried to work with, uh, trying to work with the city uh, to make sure that there's a space to do that. So, um, you know, for talking, the, the city obviously has a Google domain because we're using this, the shared drive. We can set up a Google voice um, number where it just goes to voicemail and we'll get those audio recordings. Um, if people want to leave statements, but then also have a place for them to submit recordings of themselves or whatever else, however they want to participate um, and are able to. Um, Chris, uh, your hand is up. Did you want to say something? No, actually, I did not intend for that to happen. I'm sorry, terribly. <laughs> it happens. That's life in Zoom meetings. Um, all right. Um, do you have any other comments, concerns, questions on this? Oh, uh, Alex? Uh, yeah, thank you so much for putting this together. Um, I was wondering if there's a, uh, you have an idea of the timeline uh, for like when it, when, you, when we'll be distributing it and when will there be sort of a cutoff point for um, you know, requesting that people give, give these, this by this date? Um, as soon as possible. I mean, the, the reality, I'm, I'm grateful that the commission is not sort of jumping into the document, changing a lot of stuff. And so far, I'm just seeing that we need to call it for at the end, the media, the, uh, media that is going to be used and the point that Nick brought up and change the, and I don't know why we didn't sort of thought about it, the appointed citizen, yeah, it's residents. Uh, but because of that, probably we can deploy it 
the latest uh, early next week. And as soon as that happens, everybody in the commission is going to get a copy. Everybody, and everybody can send it everywhere. Just please don't assume that somebody will send it to Safe Passage. Just send it, or please just send to whoever you want. And I mean, I know Alex, you have been waiting for a while to be able to go and do the outreach. So this is going to be a really good position to do it. Um, to to follow that, and when we'd like it back. Um, one of the things that we want to do is make sure that we have a chance to sort of parse through and weigh what we hear. Um, you know, it it may impact what um, what we're doing. It may just sort of reify what we're already doing as well. So, like, to be able to give us time to react um, is going to be a little bit, and also to make sure that it's done in a way and in a time that allows us to um, to sort of have these at the same time or a very similar time to the um, to the public hearing holding so that they can be part of that. Um, and because there is a difference between, um, you know, oh, here's a file, go listen to 30 different recordings and okay, here's the captive moment um, in a public hearing and having that voice count as, the, as much as somebody who can sit in a Zoom meeting for two hours um, to make a comment as well. So, um, I think part of this is also going to be um, you now as part of this this agenda item is the setting up when our next um, public hearings will be. Right. Um, we have two that we have to hold before March 18th. Ideally, <laughs> we would hold them sooner rather than later, um, but to also make sure that you know we're getting at least some some folks or the opportunity for some folks to speak who wouldn't be able to make that meeting as well. So I'm going to open this up with two thoughts and one we discussed this um, much earlier, but um, and we only need a quorum <laughs> to hold a public hearing. Um, and so one of the thing, a couple different options would be to have uh, a meeting during the day. Um, so before 6pm, which is when one of the comments was that a lot of folks are in um, shelters or other locations where they don't have access to or like they don't have the space to sort of do these things in the evening. Um, and then another option would be to have a weekend where it's not a weeknight, maybe people are a little freer um, if they're working. It's not a perfect um, solution, but having those as options as well. And then the last thing to say, even though I don't think anybody wants uh, at this point to do this is that our requirement is two, but it's at least two, we could hold more as well. Again, we still need a quorum of people. So we still need, um, if we're back at 14, we need at least seven people or eight people, sorry, eight people um, who can join that meeting and be there for the entirety of it. Um, so that's something to think about as well. And at this point, we do not have um, a full uh, commission to talk about these times either just as a note for folks. So I guess actionable questions. Would any or would folks be willing to do something during the day? Or do you have the capacity to do something during the day? Yes. Do you have the capacity to do something on the weekend? So those, those two. Um, and then a third question, I'm thinking probably towards the middle of February, the later part of the middle of February, um, so like February like 18th or something to give us a month or so, but then to have early. That would be the second one, right? Yeah, that would be our second Yes. Year. I think that's place ideal and give us enough time to be able to deploy the document. I mean, I, honestly, I'm more worried about being able to have enough time to be able to collect testimonies of affected communities than anything else. So that day works pretty good for me. All right. Um, so since I don't think this is going to be, we, don't, we are missing a number of folks. Um, what I can do, I will propose that time or that day and send out um, and Noah, um, we can work together to get confirmation from folks to make sure that we have enough for a quorum to attend that. Yeah. 
Karen? So in terms of the first public hearing, could we recommend, could we ask um, for the week of the 8th of February? That's like three weeks from now. Does that feel like too much of a crunch from now until then? Or? Because then, then we could have maybe three more weeks before the uh, second, two or three weeks before the second public hearing. So a question to Dan and Carol as a our subcommittee. We're we're going to need time for us to be able to to process the testimonies that we're going to be getting. Do you do you guys feel yes. that is is going to be enough time? Perhaps not. Uh, there is there are going to be considerable um, working through of these testimonies because they're coming in different forms. Yeah. So and then uh, and then agreement among among us of but what what are the thematic you know what are the important points? Yeah, it, it's pretty labor intensive. You're right. Um, Cynthia, and then I think I saw another hand go up, but I don't know where it was. Um, I think, um, Dan, you and I were, were talking about, and this might be helpful, um, because we have the hearings in front of us and we have the report in front of us. Um, I'm just recommending that maybe Dan and I can put together a timeline of possible dates for different things, when they would need to happen, when they would need to be due, knowing that it's completely a draft, but sending it out and, um, you know, with the requirements of we've got to have a um, um, a majority, mem a number of members of commission, et cetera, all the requirements. And then um, outreach folks can plug in to, to where, how their process is going. And we can always adjust the dates, but um, March is really pretty soon. And we're not in a, um, we haven't yet had the conversation of the recommendations, just very general, just a very general conversation. So maybe a timeline can um, help us to do that. And we can get it out certainly before the next meeting. Yeah, I really like that idea. Um, Nick and then Carol. It looks like Michael's hand is always up. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I just was thinking in terms of uh, two more public hearings. We have not had a public hearing since the interim report. And I know I know there's a lot of response and, and, and uh, uh, thoughts about that report. And I don't think we need to wait. Uh, we'll, we, the testimony um, uh, that we're reaching out for will be available for the next public hearing. But I'm just saying from, from a timing perspective, I don't see a problem with holding the second public hearing sooner than later. That's just, just um, my thought. And also David has suggested um, maybe a lunchtime, uh, a lunchtime public hearing. Um, Javier? I do see a problem with that. I mean, we, and, and being frank, I mean, we already have the, the public speaking portion of each meeting. Uh, the public speaking portion, at least, you know, this, the uh, alternative subcommittee has a public speaking portion. So people who have the luxury of having internet being able to do a what and see i really have it i want us to focus and be able to give center place to to those testimonies and and i think that our our in our, our ourself in inconvenient about that it's, it's minimum problem for the price of being able to to be able to bring those testimonies at all because we don't we because we cannot even say that we have we have those testimonies a tiny bit. We have one today, and that's it. Literally, we have one today of an affected person. And before, I don't even remember we ever had one. Maybe other person, maybe. So uh, for me, it's a big issue to center and to be able to accommodate in the next public hearings those voices that are not there.
Oh, and I'm muted. All right. <laughs> um, so I think that's one of the things that I've that I've been sort of thinking about too is how do we make sure that we balance all of these things um, and give ourselves enough time to react. Um, if I'm honest, I don't think that anything's super different than what we already know is going to happen, but um, or that's going to come out of that. I think we already know a lot of these themes, um, but I do think that it's important to be open to the fact that there may be something that we are missing that we haven't hit on that um, that there's a real issue that we aren't necessarily giving attention to, and that we'll get that from these. Um, but I also think part of this is going to be community outreach and community education. And one of the things that happens is that in these meetings, people who say there are no problems with policing or you know that there's no purpose to this commission, well, giving them experience and access to those stories in a, in a sort of captive space, um, I think is really important as well, because that's that's giving people who who are in this in this space the chance to interact in ways that they normally wouldn't. Um, so I think it's going to be a balancing act between the, the time that we have um, and then the what we expect these public hearings to be, which you know is a place for us to hear everything, but it's also a place for others to speak um, and to hear from other residents or other people who spend time in Northampton. But I realize that also just complicates things rather than offering a concrete solution. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I like David's idea of doing something during the day. Um, the one thing that I think we might run into, we'll have to put out something that's, you know, lunchtime is generally an hour or so. Um, if we have, you know, people that are giving, you know, three to five minute, you know, statements, that does limit the number of people that can. That can participate. Our last, our first meeting went, I want to say, four hours in that public hearing. Um, so to think about what we might need to do if it's multiple lunchtime <laughs> hearings to make up for that. Um, that I think is going to be important. Uh, Alex. Um, yeah, I would suggest that it be multiple hours, something like 11 to 1 or 1.30 or, or something. But the idea that whenever people could join, they could come and they don't have to come for the whole thing, but they know that they'll have that window. All right. Um... So that's something to consider. So I think um, the best way forward, um, we can take all of that suggestions and Cynthia and I will work on a timeline and get that out. And then we'll make sure that folks can actually make those, those times. Um, does that sound reasonable to everybody? All right. Um, so unless there's any more discussion, we'll go into updates from subcommittees. All right. Um, for the subcommittees, um, do start with the alternatives um, subcommittee. Do you have anything that you would like to update? I realize that Booker is not here. Yeah, I'm the co-chair. Um, so the, the last meetings we have been the uh, working and workshopping the document that um, and I want to say thank you to Carol who was the one sort of building a unified voice in many many voices that our report had I really appreciate the expertise that she brings um, the work that Alex did and Booker also did on the document um, one of the things that we had been talking for the last month and um, for the last month and a half is that Certainly, we want to focus in domestic violence and, se and sexual abuse in the oncoming meetings of the sub of this uh, alternative subcommittee. So, um, really, if uh, we, everybody in the commission, everybody in the public, in the community is welcome to attend. I think um, it's it's really important when when we are going to different subcommittees that are not our own. Because in that way, uh, you help us in the alternatives to see things in a different way and maybe to think uh, about specific things that we're not thinking in that moment. 
if there is anything else that Alex or Carol wants that you guys want to add or are missing. No, that's good. And we next we meet tomorrow at seven thirty. It's our next meeting. Oh yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um. So moving on, uh, is there anything up for discussion for that? Before we move on. Okay. Um. So the next is um the policies and services. Nam, do you want to? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I just unmuted yeah. myself. And then I'll, I'll, I, I can add something if, if you'd like. Yeah, great, because I can. I'll just give the general outline of how, what we did in all these meetings. Our, our meeting, our group met Tuesday, January 12th, um, and um, Nick's been leading the meetings. But we had a good uh, conversation um, about trying to get a sense of you know kind of our way, having done the work of uh, preparing text for the interim report. Um, I think we mostly turned our attention to kind of where do we want to go kind of next. And we, um, you know, what, so, you know, in, in preparing the interim report, I think we found ourselves focusing on what uh, we felt, what data we felt we had in hand and we can easily write about. And there were things that were not yet in hand that we knew we wanted to get to later. And, and I guess top of mind of there would be the complaint process. And we have now gotten some data. We had some discussion about um, some of the complaints that have come in and, and, and you know, we're kind of trying to think about, um, uh, you know, it's certainly brought us to a discussion about um, needing to reform over, uh, oversight, you know, uh, of, of the complaint process and, you know, and, and wanting to kind of think about how to do better with that. Um, uh, there was, uh, Cynthia pr provided a report on domestic violence, elaborated on that report, it overlapped a bit um, with, um, with uh, other committee um, input. Um, and then Nick provided a short report on the homeless uh, liaison officer, noted that it overlapped quite a bit with uh, the work being done by the alternatives committee and kind of seeded, and Nick can elaborate on this, but basically seeded the, the, uh, the, the emphasis on that topic of the homelessness to the other subcommittee, feeling like that work was being done um, to Nick's satisfaction elsewhere, but he can, he can probably elaborate on that. Um, but then I would say that the bulk of the, the meeting towards the end was really trying to begin the process of, of agreeing as a, first of all, uh, establishing that we agreed, that all of us agreed, that it would be worth inviting the police chief to attend one of our um, upcoming meetings. And we did achieve consensus on that in our subcommittee. And then we assigned ourselves the task of generating questions um, that we would give the police chief ahead of time. Um, we had some discussion about you know, the value of, of inviting the police Chief and, and, and again came to the view that there, there could be some value in at least hearing. Um, well, just we had a lot of questions on our committee that we felt we wanted to have answered. So um, what, where we left off was that we were all to generate questions uh, and share them with the subcommittee. In our next meeting, we're going to kind of, I guess, to hone down the list of what we're going to be asking, and then we'll submit that to the police chief and then invite her, I guess, in the meeting following that. Um, so that's my basic recollection of what we covered in our in our meeting. Um, Again, I asked Nick and Cynthia who are here and David, if you, if you wanted to add anything that I forgot or want to elaborate. I'll, I'll add a little something. I think uh, uh, we are uh, 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 trying to tackle uh, uh, the question of how we want to uh, 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 use the meeting with the uh, police chief and I think that's a, a work in progress. The questions are not just a list of questions, they're a basis for discussion about how to um, uh, bring in the police chief and, uh, and uh, get uh, uh, any input from her. Um, additionally, uh, one of the callers uh, earlier tonight wanted to, uh, made a strong request for oversight uh, to the grievance and complaint process. Uh, uh, I, I don't know if it was specifically to that. I think it was um, uh, with with the police. And I, I want to say that's that's on our agenda. That's that's um, we're very interested in that area. Um, and we probably um, 
we, we, we are going to go over, we have uh, three years of uh, data um, of, of various uh, uh, investigations and how they were conducted and some of the outcomes. And then we are also going to, um, uh, uh, we'll probably be wanting to address it directly with the police chief. All right, awesome. Um, oh, Carol? So question to the committee, uh, the subcommittee. Do you anticipate when you schedule a meeting with the chief that you would have, it's an open meeting, right? So there'd, there'd be other community members signed on to the meeting, correct? Is, is that typically what happens in your subcommittee? Well, just like your subcommittee. Yeah, uh, right, uh, right. Uh, yeah. People, we have regular observers and intermittent observers and right. but we, right. we have not, we, we wouldn't have um, participation in this case. You wouldn't, so that it was be uh, listening in. Yeah, I wonder if uh, what your thoughts are on whether it makes it easier, might make it easier for other people to sign on to that meeting um, if uh, the chief would come in civilian clothes. If she'd even be, if she'd even be willing, if if she, if she would be willing, you know. That's a topic for discussion. That's, that's yeah. I'm 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 turning that I'm I'm turning that I'm turning that to your subcommittee for oh, consider hey, hey, for no, consideration. That's, that's perfect. Yeah, that's a really important uh, question. Yeah, I guess we could discuss that as a as a subcommittee and see if we can achieve some agreement about whether that is, um, um, you know, one of the things I think that we, we talked about was the value of having this conversation happen in a subcommittee um, that it honor the agenda of our subcommittee and, the, and, and, and not necessarily take on the agenda of the broader um, commission. So I guess I would say if we come to an agreement that is a subcommittee that that, that requirement fits um, our agenda then I think we'd likely go in that sure. direction. Sure, the same. Are there any other um, any other statements? Anything else for discussion? All right, uh, I'm not seeing anything. Um, so I'll open it up for the spending and subcon. Or sorry, spending and contract subcommittee. Sure, uh, I can speak a little bit to that. Uh, so given what we have gone over in our preliminary report we kind of brainstormed some actionable steps we could make uh, going forward from and, and adding on to what the work that we've done in the preliminary uh, in the preliminary report. Uh, some of that includes as being part of the spending and contracts subcommittee, uh, actually looking at the collective bargaining of both the police unions and the, the what responsibility Northampton as a municipality has to those uh, police unions uh, in order to kind of suggest ways to move forward next time negotiations come on the table in terms of things such as staffing and salary and overtime and kind of uh, seeing where funds can go and what uh, is actually possible for the uh, city of Northampton. Uh, so that's kind of like one of our big undertakings. Um, I'm sure some of the other one, other um, committee subcommittee members uh, have the, their actionable steps that they want to make um, some solid comments on as well. Yeah. Um, so I'll just go really briefly, um, and Michael, I see you as well. Um, so one of the things that the chief reacted pretty strongly to was the graphs that we've so far that um, had our time. So looking at what they had for report logs. Um, unfortunately, she was on vacation and didn't get back to us until like the day before the report. Um, so that didn't really go far. Um, but um, we've been able to take into account some of the things that she had um, and we're still trying to put together an idea of at least what is what the costs are associated with some of these things and what the time is. Um, with some of these calls or activities that the Northampton police are engaged in. Because if we're talking about responsibilities being taken away, um, you know, if, if we propose a new department, if we propose 
that it goes to some service agency, anything like that, the first question they're gonna ask is, how much are you asking us to do or take on? And I think, I think that's gonna be the first question. And the second question is gonna be, how much are you gonna give us to do this? Um, and so really thinking about what we can at least expect in terms of what the city pays now um, and what the city allocates now in terms of personnel time through different departments, um, but to actually, to make at least a rough estimate uh, because otherwise you're just sort of guessing and doing armchair math, um, which is not, not as good as it could be. We're not gonna have a perfect accounting of time. Um, the police, their, their own time tracking system isn't perfect um, and does, isn't really meant to do that. Um, if you wanted a, like a minute by minute thing, the department probably have to do a time audit for themselves. That's a whole separate thing um, that they would need to do. Um, but at least to give an idea of what, what they do um, and what the costs are, um, I think that's, that's where we are um, at the moment. Um, and then uh, Lois and Michael, I, and I don't know which of you got up first. <laughs> Lois, I think, is ahead of me. Uh, one of the things that um, I wanted to know, and uh, we submitted a question to the DA, uh, is to get to this question of what's, what's the consequence of the arrest that the police make. And uh, so we asked the DA for um, how many of the arrests lead to charges and uh, what those charges are and what the results of those charges are. And so, because um, I wanted, I, I mean, I've been saying there's basically no crime in, in Northampton. And so this to me seemed like a way to get at uh, what kind of crime is there. And uh, so that request went to the DA uh, I think before Christmas sometime, I can't remember exactly when it was. And and they said, because of COVID, and I can't remember what the other person was, um, they wouldn't be able to answer until after the 21st, I think was the date that they did. And so uh, hopefully we'll get that. I mean, I've been looking at some of the arrest um, logs and, uh, and again, this is one of those things where there's just like, you know, there's no, uh, you have to read each interaction. Uh, I mean, the woman who testified uh, spoke earlier uh, asking for some kind of comprehensive yearly report from the police that actually somebody could read and question. I hope there's a recommendation that the commission makes. I hope you made a really good point. And um, I, it, it, I mean, one of the challenges that probably all the, the police records are, are almost unintelligible other than by going through a uh, date by hour by hour by hour. And um, there's no cumulative information at all. <laughs> and um, so anyway, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, what kind of report we get from the DA. And we'll share it. All right, Michael. And then the, uh, the other thing that we talked about briefly was uh, a series of questions uh, to, to reach out to communities and, and Noah had forwarded to, uh, to us the, uh, make sure I say it right, the Brattleboro Community Safety Report, um, and, and how how did how does Brattleboro how did they roll it out and how did they finance this? And we heard from from Rachel that Toronto was raising taxes to uh, to finance their pilot program, um, which I don't think is a recommendation this commission necessarily wants to make. Uh, but I do think uh, as I looked at that uh, Brattleboro report, you know how do you how do you roll that out? So so uh, creating a series of questions that we might reach out to other communities that have done things like this. Uh, and ask them how they how they accounted for it, basically. Yep. And part of that also comes back to, and you know, the sort of like, if you do X and you spend X now, you know, Y years later, you'll have a reduction in crime. 
in, in these different things that we that you identify as crime. And so like, you know, if you intervene early, um, you know, in terms of all these after school programs that cost money, if you intervene and you have, you know, multiple different types of responders and you're responding, you're maintaining two different departments of responders for a little while as you figure that out, you sort of get everything trained. If you're paying for additional training for dispatch so that they know what to do and where to send people, um, I think it's gonna be cog being cognizant of the fact that this isn't about necessarily saving money, um, that if there is a return on investment in terms of money, that's gonna be down, down the line, but that there isn't a return on investment in terms of safety pretty quickly. And I think that's what's been shown, but like we have to be aware of the fact that anything that we're doing is going to cost money and that excuse me, that money is going to have to come from somewhere. <laughs> um, and, you know, if it's, you know, a budget cut from different departments, that's one option. But what are the other options that that exist? And what, and really, the sort of question, like, how much do we need to start these pilots? What does that cost? Um, and I think that's going to be part of, that's the harder part, <laughs> um, as we don't have necessarily a good idea of even what we want to recommend in terms of specifics. Um, in terms of like the processes, are we recommending, you know, do we want to recommend a pilot or do we want to recommend a, you know, a massive change really quickly? Um, those sort of things change sort of that discussion as well. Are there any other, no, oh, Alex? Uh, if you're ready for questions, is there yeah. anyone else who's going to report or? Okay. Um, <clears throat> The let's see. Um, yeah, I think there's definitely, you know, it's something that the alternatives committee will be thinking about is is what will it cost to roll out suggested alternatives. So we should coordinate on that. Uh, the other was had to do with detail work. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things we talked about was recommending using civilian flaggers where legally where it's legally allowed and what are the implications of that? And my, I wonder when you look at the contract, um, what if that says anything about about that work? Um, so just a request there. Thanks. Yeah, I don't. Nothing immediately comes to mind um, about language, but it's also not something I've I've looked at specifically. Um, I think Josie, um, Josie's going to be looking at that. They volunteered, um, <laughs> and I'll also be poking at those contracts too, um, a little bit more in depth. Definitely. Um, so uh, Javier and then Lois. Um, maybe because in this, in the next month, uh, a lot of what each subcommittee is going to be looking into it is going to overlap maybe and this is just a suggestion that some subcommittees may have joined meetings if that's something that is doable or for or not i don't know if that's something that we can do or it's legal or not but i think would be a good option yeah um can we table that one just to talk about it in new business because uh yes that's gonna come up <laughs> um Lois? Uh, this is just, uh, I, I, I just happened to hear this uh, radio interview this morning um, with someone, a reporter from uh, Atlantic, who did a story on cahoots uh, this summer. And he said uh, that during the time that he was there, cahoots had gotten 300 inquiries from uh, cities to do uh, consulting for new projects in those cities. So I just throw that out for people who are thinking about uh, contacting uh, CAHOOTS at some point. And it's going to be a big, big, long line that we're going to be in the back of. So uh, I just thought that we ought to know that. Okay, is there any other discussion? Okay, um, so this sort of ties into this and it's something that 
I think we've all been thinking about in different ways, um, which is how do we, well, first off, what are we gonna, what do we wanna produce at the end of this process? Um, and also how are we going to do it? Um, and one of the things um, that comes up is that the commission, you know, we divided into these subcommittees to sort of figure out what's happening, um, you know, in terms of what are alternative options, what's happening within the city, uh, you know, looking at, you know, how, how the money moves um, and those sort of things. But we're also hitting the point where we really need to start collaborating and bringing all of those things together. And unfortunately, uh, like we've seen today, Tonight, I mean, these general commission meetings tend, they get filled up with process <laughs> um, and not much substance. And I don't think the process is necessarily gonna go away. I think it's still useful to have those. So we have these sort of touch bases, but we can also introduce new things. Um, but one of the things that we might end up needing to do is either you know, holding larger, longer meetings, which I don't think a lot of people wanna do, um, or holding more meetings, which is again, a time commitment there. Um, but to get those conversations happening, so it could be joint <laughs> subcommittee meetings. Um, it could be, um, you know, maybe we have a general commission every meeting every week. I mean, we only have, you know, until the 18th of March to deliver a report. And I would love for it to not be uh, me trying to make changes to a document at 3 a.m on the 17th um, <laughs> before submitting that. Um, and so really thinking about what we're, what we're looking at as an, at an end goal and then working at the, the sort of the deeper part, which is making recommendations and balancing, making really concrete and specific actionable recommendations um, where there's not a lot of room for misinterpretation, but there is room for opening um, and, and sort of implementing it so that the folks who are in charge and have the power to make those changes or make those recommendations happen that they feel empowered to do it in a way that makes sense to them based on where they are as well. Um, and to do some of the work to figure out who can do what or who, knew, who needs to do what to make these recommendations happen. So where power sits, is it executive? Is it legislative? Is there a department? Um, that we wanna see what's the process for creating that, where, you know, and to also be aware of the challenges that are gonna come up and have a process for <laughs> reevaluation during that, during that process as well. So all of those things, um, which brings us to the <laughs> sort of new business of just re-examining what our schedule is, has been and what it could be. Um, but again, also recognizing that we have a large number of people who are not here at the moment. Um, so that was a really broad <laughs> item, but does anyone have any thoughts that come to mind immediately? Um, yeah, uh, Namdi? Yeah, sorry, I don't have the hand raising feature on mine for some reason, don't know why that is, I'm having to do it old school with a real hand. Thank you for uh, recognizing me. Um, so it occurs to me at this point in the process that um, I'm having a hard time imagining a final document that is a, um, that somehow expresses a consensus view. And actually I kind of think that an F, any effort to do that would likely, um, or an effort to do that, I don't wanna to speak too broadly here, but I think we might lose a lot of valuable diversity of opinion that, that is in this group by trying to kind of create something homog that homogenizes the view of everybody. So if we, if, if that's true, if I'm correct about that, that actually there's, there's a ton of diversity here, then if we can sort of imagine a final document that actually, that really is more like a, a laundry list of possible paths that the, that the city might take, elaborated in detail by the people here who are most expert in being able to sort of articulate their view, you know, so just to, um, just to give one example, there's clearly an, an, an abolish kind of uh, uh, movement, sub-movement that, that exists um, either in the commission or, and or in the public that has come to speak to the commission. And I think it'd be wonderful to have a very detailed story that's laid out about what an abolishment would look like. 
And I think that there are others who might have a view of certain reforms they'd like to see. And I think it'd be lovely to have that. And I think those things, to me, the, I, it, I, the two can't logically coexist in a document that is trying to be a consensus document. So you can't logically you know, make a strong case about abolishment in a case, in a, in a consensus document that's also trying to talk about reform. Um, but I, I do think that it's, it's quite valuable to policymakers to have thoughtful paths that they might take, that they can pick and choose from, but we've done the legwork to describe what walking down this path would look like. Um, so, and, and so if that's the way to go, then, then I think um, something that sort of follows along the lines of what we've been doing, that really, you know, kind of assembling those parts in smaller groups and then, you know, stitching them together into, you know, into a larger kind of document in the end um, might be a, a way forward. But I, I'm curious to know what others think about should we be investing our time in trying to come up with, you know, some kind of, to what extent do we need to have some kind of consensus? Do we need to kind of have a kind of grand plan um, that, that we all buy into and sign off on? Um, and actually, even think about jo uh, Josie's comments earlier, you know, sense that he feels uh, some discontent about putting his name on something that doesn't reflect his point of view. I'd hate to have him do that. I'd rather have him articulate his point of view as clearly as he can and, uh, and with whatever depth and wisdom he has. And I don't want him to step on my point of view in order to, you know, kind of uh, have that happen. I'd like to have mine in there as well. So I think, you know, how can we, how can we accomplish that? That's my thought. So I'm going to recognize Javier and then myself and then Carol. And then, oh, sorry. Um, so Javier, Lois, myself, Carol. Thanks. Um, so we hear a lot in the in the last four years about we need to give the diver the, the diverse um, sort of statement or here now the diverse report. I I think uh, uh, trying to ch trying to aim for a uh, for a uh, for that kind of sort of uh, different different point of view. It's cherry picking, and that makes first is for me for my point of view is a disservice. If you go back and you read the mission of the commission, it's a disservice to the mission of the commission. That's for first. And second, uh, we are already in a huge disadvantage. The mayor can see whatever we come out and say, no, you know what? This is not. This is not what we're doing. Oh, this is not doable. This is this is it's not money for it. There's so many reasons. Trying to go for a, for a, for um, it's sort of going for a route that is not concrete and giving sort of a platter of things for him to cherry pick what he feels more comfortable. I don't think that's our call. Our call is to come out with something that we feel that we believe that needs to be changed. I mean, hopefully we're in a, we're in we're in a point that we are agree at least that the status quo has to change in policing in Northampton as an institution. I think that hopefully everybody here understands that. So I, I, I don't know. I do feel that trying to go for a mid, mid, middle of the ground, uh, old voices and show all voices, it's something that is going to be a disservice to what we're doing here. All right. Um... Sorry, so Lois, myself, and then Carol. I had originally thought <clears throat> that um, or at some point early on, I thought, well, maybe what we will end up with is a majority report and a minority report. <clears throat> and uh, and that tells me is an idea, possibility. Um, and then the other thing, though, is uh, not, I don't know exactly how this would work out, but I'll just put it out there. Um, that it seems that there are some things that we do have agreement on. And um, like, for example, I, I would say that there's agreement that the police, that it would be better to not have the police be first responders when people are having uh, mental health crises. Um, and, and, and then what that would mean, would that mean a pilot project? Would that mean, you know, whatever those things that fall from that? And I don't know, I mean, maybe it's possible to uh, say, 
you know, there are these, I don't know how many there are, maybe there are two, maybe there are three things that everybody agrees on and that to articulate those things and then to also have the other things that we don't agree on or we probably won't agree on, which is how fast uh, the city should move to implement other things. And um, and so some people will move, want to move more slowly than others. And so, I mean, maybe there's one chunk that's the agreement chunk, and then there's another chunk that's the, um, the divergent path. And I don't know if the divergent path then undercut the, the agreement chunk or not. Uh, but um, that seems to me maybe to try to, to go, I mean, for the things that um, probably there are things that we agree on, like, uh, uh, I mean, it, it could be uh, stops and ticketing as another one. Uh, I mean, maybe, maybe we can't agree on that. But anyway, so that's, that's an idea that I have. Those are ideas that I have. All right, so um, I'm gonna go myself and then Carol um, and then Alex and David. Um, I'm just gonna make this really short. I think one of the things that we can do is have a short-term, long-term, see reform as sort of the short-term, like do those things quickly, they're the, the bare minimum, um, and then move towards abolition, uh, right? Because if we're, you know, as we're reducing the need for police as it, as it is in the way that it is, the way that law enforcement functions um, and the need for it, we can pretty easily move towards, maybe we don't have that um, in the, you know, in the future um, at all. And then if we're talking about establishing a department um, of, you know, community care or community safety or whatever it ends up being called, that that department could absorb the crisis response um, that the police handle in different ways. And there's all sorts of things that are gonna come up um, in terms of how that interacts with Massachusetts state law, with, um, you know, in terms of what the, the city requires. So thinking about those, those are gonna be long-term fixes, um, but they're long-term, they're long-term, that that's not gonna be something that we can say, oh, here's the, here's the perfect plan, it takes 10 steps and you're done. Um, so I think there is a way to sort of get to the point, I, I think most of us agree that abolition isn't gonna happen in two days. Um, neither will reforms, um, but one of those is faster than the other. So I think there are ways that we can still have a coherent narrative saying these are the first steps, this is the goal. Um, but we do have to reach consensus about what that goal is and how far off <laughs> it might be if we're talking about processes. Um, and I do think that, that that's worth at least trying to do, even if we don't reach consensus and we do have another model um, where it's, you know, by topic um, or it's by uh, minority majority of those things. I think it's still worth trying to reach some form of consensus and understanding where we are um, and, and doing that sort of work that's very, I would say contentious, right? Like, you know, we all have ideas that we're bringing in. Um, so I'd say it's worth trying at least. Um, before we hit that. Um, and because it allows us to present something that's a holistic approach. It, it kind of concerns me if we're giving things piecemeal that, you know, it's like, all right, well, we did the first thing and that was it and that's enough. Uh, and so thinking about how we can make this, because the transformation is, is holistic. We sh I'm hoping that we can have something that does provide a holistic overview of these are the changes that we want to see and there's a lot of them. So that's my hope anyway. Um, so next is Carol and then um, Alex, David and Chris. Okay, I'll be quick because um, those of you who have already spoken to this issue of how do we get to that final report and what about consensus, I think you've already made the points. Um, I, I just wanna underscore, I liked uh, Nambi's idea about um, it seems so honest to me and uh, has the integrity of what our process really looks like. Um, there are two major positions here within the commission and with 
within the um, the advocates and community members who have joined us here. And um, you've mentioned abolition versus reform. I, I I don't see it as a majority minority report. I see I uh, we're not a jury. We don't have to come to a unanimous uh, agreement on what we're recommending. But I do think we're going to be more effective if we can come up with some specific recommendations that we urge the city to move on immediately, such as creating, I think we've spoken to those tonight, you know, offloading. One theme that comes up is offloading uh, pieces of tasks that, that cops are doing now that they should not be a part of and and in specifically mental health crisis response. And so as specific as we can be, I think we're gonna be more effective around those things that we feel that we already have consensus around. The other thing that came up tonight was the, the issue of where do complaints go? I mean, it's absolutely absurd that an institution says, if you have a complaint with us, call us. You know, that's not acceptable. So, you know, what are we recommending instead? Um, there's lots of things that have been brought to us from community members, including, you know, developing demographic um, databases on, on the demographics of, of stops, arrests, et cetera. Um, so uh, I don't have a problem with our not achieving absolute consensus because I think it would be achieving consensus. You know, I'm a member of a Quaker meeting and I can tell you achieving consensus without votes takes months and sometimes years. And I'm not sure in this case it's worth it because there's valid, there there is validity in both positions here, moving towards um, the ideal of abolition and doing something specific restructuring in the meantime. So um, I guess that's, those are my comments. All right. Um... And then we have Alex, David, Chris, and then Josie. Uh, thanks, everyone. A lot of people mentioned uh, some of the things I was going to say, but I would add um, one possible path is for us to uh, draft an outline of what the report would look like, um, divide up that work both in open meetings that may not be our existing subcommittees, but might be more focused on an element of that outline, um, and then also as individuals. Um, I wanted to say also that there is uh, there is power in putting forward a, a proposal, an idea, and debating that and spending the time in the commission, um, in, even if we don't achieve consensus. Uh, but, um, you know, really saying, okay, why don't we take this stand and then deciding whether we want to take that stand or not and, and making that debate um, in a pub publicly. And then... Um, I think most of the other points were covered, you know, that we may have some consensus on what, but not on when. Um, another idea is that if we set metrics, for example, you know, if this is met, if this program gets uh, for alternative mental health response uh, <clears throat> is successful, um, then, you know, that, that this, that we recommend that this, this happen in terms of funding or in terms of the next step. Um, and uh, I guess that's that's all for now. Thanks. All right. Um, so David and then Chris and then Josie. Yeah, very quickly, because as Alex said, uh, others have already touched on this. Uh, respectfully, I, I think we should move on. I think um, uh, Nandy may well be right. Uh, that we, we don't reach a consensus, but it's clear to me we have an obligation to try to reach consensus. And where we go if we can't reach consensus, I think is a conversation to have down the road. Um, and um, I think that we may be surprised as to the number of things that we do have consensus on uh, when, we, when we sit down. Uh, Maybe it's uh, some broader things. Maybe we're going to differ on some details, but um, again, I, I think it's I think it's clear uh, that that we have an ob obligation at least to try to achieve consensus. That's all. 
All right, thank you. So uh, Chris and then Josie. Okay, I think uh, just to sort of piggyback on some things, some ideas that uh, Dan mentioned earlier, I think one of the ways we can achieve the consensus is to start viewing the whole situation differently, um, viewing it a little more holistically and almost like uh, an organic thing that needs to grow. Um, what does that look like? Well, maybe it looks like uh, starting out with reform and then ultimately our, con our consensus or where we can start to build consensus is the idea that the community should ultimately police itself. I think we can agree on that. Um, but again, it's, it, it, I think it starts with starting to look at the issue in a completely different manner as this thing that needs to start out as one thing and then end up another. And that's all. All right, thank you. And so Josie, and then I'll throw myself in too. Sure, sure. I, I feel like, you know, from many of the conversations that we've had here over the past few months, you know, some of the, the proposed changes from the alternatives and the policies commission, as well as the spending subcount, um, so, so, so spending and contract subcommittee, um, you know, we talk about this, this uh, reform versus abolition and like quite respectfully, reform has had hundreds of years, at the very least a hundred years to, to kind of prove that it is a, an avenue worth taking. And again, we have empirical dev uh, evidence that suggests that it's not. Uh, not only that, we have the very metrics from our own Northampton Police Department that suggest that there is no reason why we should be putting any more money into the hands of our police department. Um, you know, I, I also believe that we should reach some form of consensus, and that's not to say that we don't do something in the meantime, as Dan has stated mm -hmm. earlier, abolition mm -hmm. is not something that happens overnight, it's something we work toward, right? And there are definitely stop gaps that we have all noticed that need to be put in place as we make that transition. Those things might appear as a reform to some, but they are very well the first steps needed to take in order to reach abolition. We need to set up uh, you know, those, 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 uh, the infrastructure for these institutions to not only be funded, but uh, the reallocation of funding away from the policing to those peer led and social programs needed by the community. Because once the community's material conditions are met, they no longer need policing. Strong communities don't need policing because the things that they need are already provided for them. That's what abolition looks like. It's not this this hatred toward police. It's not that we are being punitive toward the police. What we want is our communities to be stronger. We want our communities to be funded in a way that they want and need to be funded. We want to lift up uh, you know, those who have been oppressed by the white supremacist structure that is policing. And to do that, we must divest from policing and invest in our communities. Now, some things like holding the police accountable with their uh, with the complaint reforms is absolutely wonderful. The police should be held accountable. But as it's been mentioned before, reform is not the, the, the end all be all. Reform is simply the first step in, in those few cases that we've already talked about towards something bigger. Uh, and going down a pathway to reform is essentially saying that you are all right with the status quo as it stands right now and upholding these oppressive structures as long as we make it look a little more pretty and a little bit more bearable for the people who are really suffering from the brunt of the actions that the police here take. Yeah, so um, thank you for that. Um, and I'll just piggyback on what Josie said, because they brought up a lot of the same points that I sort of think about is that the more you look at the ways in which the institution of policing works, um, the more you see that it's not necessarily, I mean, re reforms are sort of patching, um, you know, patching a tire, you know, when there's already so many holes in it, you might slow things down, but you know that there's a lot of problems um, and that a simple patch isn't going to work. Um, and so I think it sort of leads us towards abolition, but I also realize that that getting towards that understanding and that sort of drawing that conclusion takes a different, it, it takes a thought process and an experience. So um, really thinking about, again, I, I still think it's worth trying to have consensus, I'll say this a whole bunch of times, um, doing the, the real work, the cognitive work that's in that. Um, and then at the end, um, 
you know, sort of preparing for if we don't reach consensus, what do we do? But really focusing on the, like, that's like not even plan B, that's like plan C um, moving forward. But what that also means is that we do need to have a space for these sort of conversations to happen. And so that's thinking about, and you know, these are not things that we can just that, we're not gonna have consensus in 20 minutes, um, you know, or, you know, maybe even five meetings. <laughs> um, you know, but if we can work towards, if we can work towards that and understand that that's maybe what our goal is. Um, and then if we need to, we can pivot, we can have, you know, like here's the, here's the, you know, reform option, here's the abolition option, here's the majority report, here's the minority report, whatever it is. Um, but really recognizing that we need to move towards consensus first, um, or at least try to, that, that's where I'm sitting. And then uh, Javier. Yep. Um, from when we talk about a holistic approach and all and, and that, I sort of understand where what we're referring to it. But my concern comes from a holistic approach is going to tend to just for us to try to, you know, we're going to try to diminish a little bit the footprint. It doesn't doesn't really address the bigger problem. And it's not a problem that happened a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, four years ago has been happening for more than a hundred years, right? And I and I I have to say this so many times, and I'm gonna keep saying it. I understand that you, uh, the, the the members of the commission, you don't feel the urgency because you don't live this. And I want you to stop and think about that. You do not feel the urgency and the importance of changes to this pervasive system because you don't live the you don't live under the system that of oppression that other people live and i really want you to think about that because at the end of the day because you are you you are in a position of privilege oh this can wait well as a person of color, that when I came here to the US in less than two months, I was stopped six times because I was driving a car that was laying under my wife. People, uh, uh, my community cannot wait. My community doesn't need a doesn't need a cos, uh, sort of a, a cosmetic approach to this. There are things that we agree. There are big changes that can be done. I ask you. To think about those changes, not from the comfort of not of your or of your lack of live experience with those this system of oppression, but to move beyond that, and understand that this is not about this commission is not about a year, three, four, five years, ten years ago. It's way more than that. Thank you. Um... Josie, did you have your hand up again? Yeah, I just want to like, it's because I literally just taught this lesson today to my students, but we were looking at the uh, the letter from Birmingham jail from um, Martin Luther King, which just states, first, I must confess that over the last few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the community's great stumbling block in the stride toward freedom is not the white citizens counselor or the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you and a goal you seek, but I can't agree with your methods or direct action, who paternalistically feels he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by the myth of time, and who constantly advises the community to wait until a more convenient season. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. And that is exactly how I'm feeling right now. All right, uh, Nandi, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, sure, thanks. Uh, a couple things. One is, uh, ironically, I um, uh, found myself teaching that exact uh, Birmingham letter yesterday, along with a longer speech that Martin Luther King gave at the APA conference uh, to a group of clinicians in Vermont. And, um, and, and yet, um, and, and 
you know, understand the message of that statement, but I think there's a way to kind of think about what we're doing um, in this commission um, uh, that to, you know, to take a position where you want to be really thoughtful about what things should be abolished and what things should be reformed, I think is not necessarily uh, taking a position that is um, um, a, akin to, to King's complaint. And I guess what I, what I would say, I'm hearing from um, the conversation we just had, we've had about, uh, about what we agree, where our consensus lies. I, I do think that we probably do have some areas of consensus that I could imagine us articulating and deciding to make the focus of um, our, our, work, our, our short term work. So trying to get a sense of what this final document could look like, we could at least begin by saying, what are the things we agree with? Um, I, I guess what I would say though, is that I, I still find myself resistant to uh, setting a priori the goal of um, trying to achieve consensus, forcing consensus. I, I think not only is that likely to, I think you're gonna lose, I guess I, I would, I, I'm arguing basically that to, to sort of press people to kind of sign on to something that doesn't reflect what they individually think is their best judgment actually will do a disservice to the community. That we brought together a group of people who have um, unique expertise and vision and I think we should think about a document that can somehow retain as much of that wisdom as possible, as opposed to trying to erase it by trying to force people to uh, all agree uh, to, a, to some kind of a piece of consensus. I think we could probably could flag some things that we do naturally agree on, and those things should be in the document. But I think that we should resist feeling pulled by anybody else here to, to, say some, to sign on to something we don't believe to be true. And I think that the final report will be better for, for including that diversity of opinion. So that's what I would say about that. All right, so um, part of this, uh, <laughs> you know, part of this is sort of figuring out what we also can do in terms of time commitments to work together to make sure that we know what, what even we're recommending um, or what's on the table. Um, I think I've tried to watch most of the subcommittee meetings if I wasn't there already. Um, and, you know, I'm also part of my own subcommittee, but I will also admit that I have not taken in every single thing, um, at, at least in a meaningful way <laughs> and, and in a substantive way. So I think part of this, and I'm not going to speak for anyone else, maybe some people have done this, um, but I haven't. Um, and I think what I'm looking for would be a willingness to either hold more meetings where we can really dig into some of these things and start talking about well what recommendations right because we're talking about where we agree and where we don't agree and i don't think that we're even at that point where we know what the discussion is right um in you know in terms of really looking at like where we are um so i think that's going to be part of this um we also don't necessarily have a described consensus model so we're saying you know we should get, we should reach consensus but we don't have a model for how we how we might even approach that, um, because we do want to avoid anything that's coercive. Um, the, like coercive consensus is not not the goal. Um, so, what? Um, so I think the first thing: are people open to longer meetings or more meetings where we have more, um, where there's less division by subcommittee and more participation as a com uh, as a whole commission, um, and just with the idea that we have. 10 ish weeks left um, to do all of this. And it's it's not a not an insurmountable um, task, but it is going to be a lot. Um, Chris? Would it be at all feasible for the uh, overall commission to uh, meet weekly instead of bi weekly? Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that is one option. The only thing that I want to point out, and I think we've already heard this a little bit, but one of the things was that there was a huge demand on time from people and there are parents um, in here as well, obviously. Um, and to make sure that that's also going to fit, like what model fits for people um, within this. I think that's going to be an important question um, for folks as well, because I don't, I don't want to put us in a position where we are, you know, at 
you know, approaching the finish line of this commission's, you know, timeline and driving more people out. Um, but with the recognition that we do need more time together in some fashion. Um, Nandy? So, you know, I am certainly hearing uh, that more time for discussion might be of use, but I'm skeptical about that. I guess I would want to see um, a proposal made for how we're going to spend this extra time. I think that it's good for us to kind of see time as a precious resource, to see it as something that has already cost us members. We started off talking about women, the absence of women, and I, and I, you know, I said in my earlier comment, we lost women from this commission precisely because of how long and the times this thing needs. And we may lose others if we go down this path. So we should not just add more time because we notice that you know we're up against a deadline. I think we could ask ourselves, what is the most efficient use? Or, or you know, I'd like to see a strong proposal of how exactly is that time going to be spent before I'm willing to kind of you know agree that we'll just take more time. And I guess not just how is it going to be spent, but I want to have it. I want to have a clear articulation about how that time results in a product, right? I think we have to kind of be starting to get a vision of what are we trying to achieve. You know, it, it, are we going to assemble that list of things we agree on that we can start to now, uh, you know, create an outline out? Like, I'd like to have a map of, of what we need to get done and then, and then how we're going to spend the time. And I think it's time to kind of do that so that we do make the best use of it before we sign on to just more time. Yeah, so I don't think that the idea was just to have more time. Um, the, the, the goal was to, I mean, you're asking, like, what are we going to even... Uh, put forward, like, how do we even determine what the list of things are without that discussion? Um, how do we know, like, even what we're bringing to the table to say, do we agree on this? Um, because there's so much and there's, I don't want to say there's overlap, but there are places where things touch um, <laughs> in terms of like topics, but very different people are looking at them with very different lenses and coming back with very different ideas of what what happens. Um, and so I think it's just important to note that. I mean, this is something, um, if we want, we can table this a little bit. And so Cynthia and I can work again, can work on that timeline, um, but also have sort of an idea of what these added times might be. Um, but yeah, I do want it to be structured. And I don't want it to be just, oh, we have more time to do the process things. I want it to be the substantive part. Um, and I think other folks have already expressed that this is the part that we need. Um, Nick? Uh, I, I just want to, uh, this has been a very, um, uh, this has been a very uh, powerful discussion and, and, and a new level of discussion. And I, I really appreciate um, the, the way people are able to speak your points of view, I'm I'm really really impressed, and and I I'm listening. What I what I want to say is at at three hours, my brain does not work as well at after three hours of meetings. So if we do change the structure, I I would advocate for shorter meetings, and I also think that puts pressure on us to accomplish something in the meetings. Um, cause often things wait till the end. Uh, so that's, that's my two cents. I, I do think, um, we're starting to get down to really basic ideas. Um, and, and, and I, I'm, I'm really impressed with Chris's contribution as a new member, uh, talking about what's, what's the larger view. What's, what's the, wh wh how can we get, think of something even larger, which will, I think, help us find areas of consensus. Um, so well, I, three, three folks just popped up. Um, so um, Noah actually had a comment. Um, so I'm gonna call on them, then Cynthia and then David. Thank you so much. Sorry, I've been, uh, have not had my video on because I am in someone else's house, but um, I, you know, I know that Dan has been going to a lot of the, um, a lot of the meetings, and I know that a lot of other folks have been going to a lot of the meetings that aren't necessarily their um, subcommittee. Um, and I just wanted to comment as a person who sees all of the meetings and listens to all of the meetings over and over. 
Um, and I wanted to suggest something and you don't have to take it <laughs> if you don't want it. But um, I was thinking it might be helpful to start trading some of the separate subcommittee meetings for combined meetings um, in general. Um, so in instead of adding more time um, to all of our plates, um, thinking about sort of where it makes most sense to combine folks into meetings. Um, even for example, having multiple full committee meetings in one week um, to sort of have a pause in the research um, and, and in order to have um, more conversations about values um, and figuring out sort of how to move forward. Um, so as not to have a break necessarily, um, but to sort of create space um, in a way that folks are sort of seeming to need. So that was just um, something that I was thinking about and potentially other folks might, um, might agree. Yeah, thanks. All right, thank you, Noah. That is something to think about. Yeah. Um, so uh, Cynthia and then David. Yeah, thanks, Noah. Uh, great suggestions. Um, I'm going to get real pragmatic. I started to sketch out our time frame, and we're not going to make it if we continue on this course. So um, I would say, kind of jumping on what Noah was saying, um, can we meet next Tuesday for two hours just to try to get some, some type of a path forward? And that's normally the policy committee um, date time. Um, and then think about meeting every Tuesday for maybe two hours just to make this more manageable and focus on this issue. And the subcommittees meet when they feel that they need to wrap things up. I think just for policy, the one thing left for us to do is to meet with the chief and that's probably about it. So I just throw that out as a, as a pragmatic suggestion. Um, that's the only way if we do want to pursue that we will need to make sure that we have that scheduled out before the end of the meeting just to get it to know and get an agenda in on time. Um, David? Yeah, I, I'd like to see the co-chairs uh, or I suppose their designees come up with a roadmap as to how we get there um, by March 18th. Um, Frankly, I, I'm just not willing to participate in longer meetings. Three hour meetings, in my view, are at least an hour too long. And, um, and I have to say, without disrespect to, to anyone here, um, we, we're not exactly efficient in the way we use our time. Uh, I don't think I've ever been on a board or commission. And, and, and let me say, I'm glad we don't follow rule, Robert's rules of order. But I've never been on a board or commission where we essentially just engage in sort of freewheeling discussion um, for three hours. Um, I don't think it's really the most efficient use of our time. I think we have to, to, to uh, I, I, I would urge the co-chairs to identify the goals, some of the topics, you know, everybody's sick of hearing me say uh, low hanging fruit, but I'm going to say it again. There are some things, again, things that we can agree on. I think we all agree that uh, the police should not be the primary responder on mental health calls. I think we all agree that um, police should probably not be in schools. So let's start building on those things in terms of what we can reach consensus on. Can we go further on the mental health stuff? Can we agree that the best method is a peer method or the best method is a peer plus professional method? I, I don't know, maybe we're not gonna get consensus on that. But let's come up with a plan to actually reach consensus on what we can get consensus on. I don't have any sense that more meetings or longer meetings are gonna help us get there. Um, I'm just gonna jump in there and say that, I mean, I think for the low hanging fruit, as you said, that's pretty, pretty obvious, but at least for me personally, I mean, one of the, one of the first things that, that came, one of the reasons that this commission exists was to tackle the harder issues. And we have no consensus on a lot of those. Um, and I think that's where we need to spend a lot of time because those are the ones that are the more difficult and where our recommendations are really gonna have to be thoughtful and really 
powerful. Like we haven't touched on how do you deal with, um, you know, racial bias in police officer interactions? How do you deal with the bias? Uh, and it doesn't have to be the explicit, you know, we're not looking at, you know, officers running down the street guns drawn, but in terms of how do you set up and, and look at holistically is there bias in traffic stops? And if so, what do we do? Um, is there bias in the way that an armed officer reacts or interacts with a person? I have no idea what the salute, how to even begin to measure that, but it's something that's important. Um, and I continue to use this example, I'll keep using it until I die, um, you know, where I had an officer watch me and my partner at Pride and have their hand on their weapon just watching their hand move there, right? That's an interaction. I was scared. My partner was like, oh, let's go talk to them and figure out what's going on. And I had the heart attack moment of absolutely not. <laughs> um, you know, but I'm not close enough where I can see a name and then make a formal complaint. You know, those sort of things. But how do we work to get those interactions down? What do we do there where there's not going to be a metric? It's not easy um, to figure out even what the cause was. Maybe it wasn't my race. Maybe there was something else going on. I don't know because that's that, that, in, that lived moment. Um, but we know that those are the moments that also end up um, or can end up where someone dies um, with that interaction, if that's the start of the interaction. So what do we do there? And so I still think there's a lot, like there's places we can go and there's low hanging fruit. And I think we should absolutely go and grab all of those and do that work. But there's still more that we have to touch on that's harder. Um, and that I don't, I don't even think we have a good definition of what those problems are, let alone what the solutions are. Um, and that's where I see having a, a broader discussion, um, where people with expertise can bring, can bring that in, um, to work on. Um, so that's my, that's my piece. Um, Javier. Um, a really basic suggestion um, with an example. I can keep saying that there's a, and somebody in the in the public comment, hold on, I have it here, talk about uh, training sensitivity for police officers who are going to mental health. Rehire police officers. I mean, I could keep telling people in the commission, in the public, uh, implicit bias, unconscious bias training don't work for police enforcement. Don't work. It's vastly known. But if people are not doing homework and, go, and saying, is that true? Before the meeting, between meetings, going and inform themselves about the issue, I can keep repeating that and, and, and people are going to keep reading the other. So I think that one of the things that would make this conversation go faster and to the point is that people would do that kind of stuff in the commission would 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 come here not only inform about what's going on with their own committees subcommittees but also about the specificities of what others are saying either to challenge those premises or to say you know what that was right let's move on i think that would help a lot uh to the level of discussion and also to how much we get done in in the specific meetings All right, um, so I'm looking at David's comment in the chat as well. Um, so I think what we have at this point, um, we can work with at least to try and figure out a process for holding more strategic meetings where the topics are in a specific, um, around specific issues, getting, sorry, we're approaching time, um, <laughs> getting those and making sure that they work for folks, um, and maybe that is dividing, and um, Cynthia brought this up before, is dividing up the, the meeting so there's not four hours, um, you know, all at once, because then you do hit that sort of Zoom fatigue, we've lost everyone. Um, so how to do that in a more efficient way as well. Um, so I think we can work on that and we'll, we'll schedule a time and get that out um, sooner rather than later. Um, does anyone have any other discussion or new business to add? Namdi? Uh, uh, quickly, I guess I'll sort of echo, echo Javier's um, suggestion and elaborate on it slightly for how we might end up more efficient. 
Um, I do think, and, and I say this as a, as a professor, there may be some advantage to having us do some homework before we come into the meetings, um, all having done the same homework, uh, all having read the same review or something like that on a particular topic. And that might, that might jumpstart us towards a kind of, you know, do you agree or disagree or have a common set of facts that we could all be chewing on. I, I leave this to the co-chairs to think, because I think you guys will need to just talk about what's the most efficient way for us to use our time. But, but I sort of like the idea of us moving forward, collectively looking at similar content, discussing that content as a group, and less discussion about opinions and more, I mean, it'll be our opinions of what we all read together, as, as opposed to our opinions about what, you know, each of us thinks about stuff. That, that might be one way forward, just a suggestion for you guys to think about outside the meeting. Um, Josie? Yeah, I, 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 I kind of agree. I think there needs to be some sort of shared understanding, especially when it comes down to frameworks. Uh, I don't want to speak for other people who have, who have an, uh, a solid understanding of abolitionist frameworks, but I feel like that's not something that you come, uh, come to hyperbolically. I feel like you go through the process of trying to understand reform before you understand that reform uh, does not work empirically and then eventually travel down the abolitionist pipeline. Uh, and so I, whenever we have these discussions, I have this uh, overwhelming dread. And again, this is an assumption on my part that there are commissioners on this commission that just lack a fundamental understanding of an abolitionist framework to policing. And I feel like uh, there is a kind of gut reaction to those sorts of uh, recommendations. Uh, and I think that a more uniform understanding of what abolitionist policies look like and what an abolitionist framework looks like would do the entire commission uh, a huge service. All right. Um, all right. So um, I have down um, that Cynthia and I will reach out and sort of try and plot a course. Um, forward thinking about these things. Um, one thing that I can tell you already that I'm thinking of is um, how do we determine what that homework is? Um, and especially taking into uh, account what Josie was just describing where they were discussing what, you know, if you're talking about a homework list, right, getting everyone on the same page is important, but what that homework list is, is itself giving somebody's op opinions and thoughts about what is important to read and to know. So thinking about that as well, because if we want to incorporate multiple frameworks into these, we have to have material that incorporates that as well, or at least introduces the thoughts as relates to those issues. Um, I, I, I just suggest that any, any one of us should be able to submit to you guys as co-chairs things we recommend everybody should read. I'm sure Josie can immediately tell he, that they have a clear idea of what all of us should be reading, and, and maybe we could you know, and, and anyone's open to share what they, so I'm not suggesting you guys come up with the syllabus. I'm suggesting that we collectively put forward anything that we think kind of everybody should see. And then, cause we've all been doing this work and then we can kind of start to talk, what you guys can do is organize it. So we all you know, do this and then read this and then we can all kind of work through it. And th that might be a way to kind of have the outside time, make us have less long meetings together. That, that's my thought. All right, uh, is there any more discussion? on this? All right. Um, in that case, looking for a motion to adjourn. Second it. Um, but, uh, do we have somebody to make the motion first? Motion to adjourn. There we go. Awesome. Nick will take a second and Namdi as well. All right. Great. Noah, can you uh, call us out? Yes. Lois? Yeah. Dan? Yes. Nick? David? Yes. Alex? Yes. Javier? Yes. Namdi? Yes. Michael? Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, Josie? Yes. Cynthia? Uh, yes. Carol? Yes. And Chris? Yes. Great. Motion is passed. All right, we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody, for coming. See you yes. next week or the week after. Yeah. Bye, everybody.